Nation. Yeah. This is an abrasion. The black family needs saving. Mental enslavement got you sexing like cavemen. Sisters that they gay friend, closer to playpen. Now you wonder why Jason is messing with gay men to make our population double. Gotta build some healthy couples. Black man and woman, born strong as healthy muscle. Brothers find a hustle, love your woman, let her trust you. Some of y'all on the down low and feminine like Russell Simmons. Whether you pitching or you catching, use a faggot. I ain't talking to y'all. Raise homers a bat now. Our God commands broken prosperity to African people. Peace to all God's beings and death to all enemies. How you doing, Black family? All right, sir. All right, y'all look beautiful out there today. Y'all look strong. I'm, I'm feeling good today. Yeah, yeah, we about to, we about to talk, tackle some tough territory, some tough terrain today. You know how it goes. Yes, sir. We got some serious things going on in our community, and so we got to go through them and try to understand what's going on. How do we get in this condition? And what can we do to stop uh, continuing in the way of our enemies? How can we find out who we are? Who were we before we got like this? And what is the condition that black people are in today? How can we do something about it? So that's why we're here today, and I want all the brothers and sisters to understand for those of you who haven't been before, it's your first time, you might get offended by some things you hear. But our object is not to offend you. That's right. Our object is to tell the truth. Right. And what happens is when you get the truth, sometimes it offends you when you've been lied to. Right. And so we can't afford no more to be nice about it because the condition we're in is no longer nice. That's right, so we're right. not going to be nice, we're going to be straightforward, but we bring the information to you because we want you to have the truth. And you take what you hear today, you take what you hear tomorrow, you take what you hear anytime you come here, and you go back and you verify for yourself, and I promise you, PKB will never lie to you. Before I go any further, I want to say a special shout out and thanks to the brother you just heard. I don't know if all of you know who you just heard, but you heard the baddest black man on the seven seas. That's brother Jelani, can you give him a round of applause? There's something very important about a guide. You know, when you don't have a guide, you can lose your direction. But as African people, right now we have no excuse. For those of you in this room, you're very fortunate because you just seen we have a guide, brother and sister. So once again, let's give Brother Kush a round of applause for waking up every morning to take African people on this journey to liberation. Well, I'm not going to be much on introductions. I wanted to say this real quickly. We put this up here so that brothers and sisters out there, this is how the way we make a living is by studying, putting information out there for our people. That's how we make a living. Now, we have some brothers and sisters who like to take the stuff that we do bootleg this stuff, and try to send us back to the Crackers Plantation. Yeah. Well, I don't know for sure, absolute certain, but I don't think Mr. Charlie is going to be very happy about what we share with African people here today. Wow. So to the best of our ability, you want to be able to stay out here. So if you see uh, some of the products from Positive Comedic Visions, you believe they've been bootlegged, this is our information here. You can give us a call, let us know where they are, so we can try to you know keep it to a minimum and stop this because... Uh, otherwise, we can't do this work as long as people are stealing from us. I don't know anybody who would like to go to work for two weeks, put their time in and watch somebody else get paid to do their work. Nobody would like that, so we always put this up. You'll see this a few times uh, throughout the lecture as we go through. Question we got to answer today, brothers and sisters. How do we get from the point where we saw ourselves like this? You see these strong brothers from the Panthers here? You see these brothers down here, they were in the group, the Kikuyu in Kenya. They called them, uh, the, the Europeans called them the Mau Mau. They were fighting for British imperialism. And if you look at the pictures, you see a sense of strength and manhood. You see a sense of fight. Someone saying, I'm not going to allow anybody to abuse my people. I'm going to go out there on the forefront. I'm going to do something about it. The question we got to answer at the end of these two days is how do we go from seeing and viewing ourselves like this to seeing ourselves like this? And you see, if you take a real good look, you say, well, these brothers don't have the same type of look. It's obvious that they don't want to put out the same energy. It's obviously they don't want to give the same message to the world of who they are. Right. They don't look to me like they want to 
uh, uh, address racism, white supremacy. They don't want to confront anything. They look safe if you want to hurt black people. So now we got to go after it and figure out now, how do we get here? Before we go any further, I want to put out a few definitions out here because these are terms you're going to hear throughout the course of this lecture. We want to make sure that you know what we're talking about. The first term we want to uh, talk about is sex. Sex is the process by which a black man and a black woman interact to produce a child. Then we have another term. It's called white sex. And white sex is perversion. And we created a term that includes every type of perversion that we can think of so that we don't start giving them different categories. If it's outside of who we are as a people, it's something different. And we might as well classify with the group that it comes from. So white sex is any act of sexual deviance and or sexual aggression deriving from Europeans that occurs between other than a consenting man and woman, including rape, homosexuality, child molestation, bestiality, orgies, any of that stuff. So when we say white sex, we can be talking about anything that is a deviation from the normal sexual human behavior of African people traditionally. Misogyny. That's a term, it's a term that refers to the hatred that Europeans have for me, females. A European, a white expression of aggression and hatred towards females, including rape, assault, murder, and various other forms of violating females. So you're going to hear these terms throughout there. When we say misogyny, we're talking about hatred towards females. When we say white sex, we're talking about sexual perversion. And when we say sex in general, we're talking about the normal process by which two human beings interact to produce a child. Now before we go any further, we want to take a trip. We got to take an intellectual trip ahead, into the past so that we can kind of recapture who we were as a people. Right. And we can dispel this filthy notion that goes around mm -hmm. that all people are the same underneath the skin. Right. Right. That means that we all think alike. We all built and come from the same culture. The only difference is the complexion of the skin. Well, that is not true. And anyone that would tell you that is either ignorant or they're lying. That's right, that's right. So we want to go back historically and see what kind of mindset did African people come out of? Who are we? And let's establish who the white race is. Where did they come from? What kind of traditional history did they come from? And then we're going to start to answer the question, how did we get in the condition we're in today? So let's start with African people. Let's start with the concept of God. Is this, is this picture clear, brothers and sisters, or is it? It's clear? Okay. In terms of our concept of God, for African people, God is perceived to be good and life-affirming, black and benevolent, God and goddess. In other words, our ancestors saw just like a child is born. No child is born with two males. No child is born with two females. A child is born with a mother and a father. Well, our ancestors said that like the creator, that created the universe, that the creation, African people were born out of the likeness of the God and the goddess who would come together and produce the likeness of the world. That made sense to us. But the European had no concept of God. When they were traveling in the caves and hills of Europe, they existing under those circumstances, they didn't even have a concept. The closest thing they had is something we'll talk about a little later. It was a Satan concept. We'll talk about it as we go on. What about black women? Black women are appreciated and valued by black men and are perceived as the black man's complimentary partner in the journey of life. If you go back thousands of years, we have to understand as a people, our whole, the whole paradigm that we operated inside of, the way we viewed women, right. was that the woman was very, very precious. The black woman was very, very, very precious because God so honored her that he chose her to be the one that would bring forth life. So we saw in many ways that the woman, in some ways, was even closer to God than we were. And so she was honored in African culture. And so the fact that she could produce children and nurture children, that wasn't something that was looked down upon. That was something that was valued and appreciated because that is the way that we viewed the world. Now, I know some people are looking and saying, that's not what I'm dealing with every day today. Well, we'll get to where you got today. But we're going back. So stick with us while we go back. And so there was an appreciation between the two. White females are hated for producing more miles for Caucasian males to feed. When the Caucasians were roaming the caves and hills of Europe and the Caucasus Mountains, it was very difficult for them to make a living. It was very cold. They couldn't drop any seeds. They couldn't plant any uh, 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 seeds and expect anything to grow. No fruits, no vegetables, nothing. So the only way he could survive was to go out and catch that wild rabbit or that wild Mongolian tur and bite right into it right then. The blood all on his mouth. Take and if he, if he was lucky enough, to avoid having it stolen from a rival clan member or by a rival group and take it home to his family, 
then he might have something once every two weeks or so that he can eat, something raw. He didn't have fire. He didn't have any way to prepare his food. That's the kind of circumstance they came out of. And one thing he noticed about the white female that the European really began to take a serious disdain for, she played this little trick on him. He could have this thing called sex, and it was the one thing he had that made him feel good. But when he did that, about nine months or so later, she produced this thing, another mouth for him to feed. And under the circumstances they were dealing in, that was a real problem because it was a it's kinda like she was tricking him. Yeah, you had this good feeling, but once you do this, big responsibilities will come out, and then you have to take care of more for so he developed a serious disdain for the white female. And that's the mindset that European comes out of. Black men are loved and appreciated by black women, and we are perceived as the black woman's complimentary partner in the journey of life. You go back thousands of years, brothers and sisters, you have to understand, the black man was a loyal man. He was a producer. There was nothing that the black woman could conceive in her mind that she wanted that he wouldn't produce. And anything that he got or anything that he produced, he turned over for enjoyment to his women and children. Every pyramid, every sign, everything, every decision he ever made, was so that he could produce something that his children and his wife and his women could enjoy. And so the black woman revealed him him almost like a god because she knew that the worst type of danger could come and she would never once have to wonder what he would do. In total reckless fashion without any regard for his own well-being, he would put himself in harm's way to keep her safe, to keep his children safe and do whatever they needed to do. He would produce high culture. Why? So she can enjoy it. They can see growth and prosperity on this planet. So it was a strong bond and love. And that is what the bedrock and the foundation of our race is built off a strong, loving, warm, caring relationship between the black man and the black woman. That's right. And so we have to always remember that because if that tears apart, there is no more black race. That's right. Exactly. White males are feared and hated for their physical abuse of white females, but heavily relied upon to provide for their family. You got to understand the type of European mindset. This is a European that only eats whenever he can find something that he can kill. So the only thrill he gets in life, we talked about the sexual thrill, we also talked about him killing something so that he can get to eat. So he was prone to extreme fits of violence. So with the white female sitting in there at any given moment, anything could set him off. He could kill her, kill the babies, eat them if he had to. She did not know, what she, you know when it was coming, how it was coming, so it was a very dangerous situation. So for that uh, physical abuse, she hated him. But at the same time, one thing she did appreciate him about him is he did go out, find food, and help her uh, survive. So it was a dichotomous relationship, very different than what African people had. And now we're going to the part here that's going to be of most interest to this particular election, sex. Sex is viewed by black people as an enjoyable means for procreation between a black man and a black woman. It is a sacred act which is taken very seriously all the time. In other words, the only concept that African people had of sex was that this is a consenting man, this is a consenting woman, and they choose to come together, and out of that, the potential exists that this is how another African life would come into this world. So it means that as much of a physical act as sex was for African people, it was just as much a, a, a spiritual act because there was something uh, uh, that existed outside of the physical that was even more important, the relationship, the bond, the, the final thing that could be produced out of that union. Let's talk about the Europeans. And this is where we're going right here, brothers and sisters. This is really what I want you to pay the most attention to because this is serious. Sex is viewed by whites as an enjoyable means of pleasure between two entities, regardless of sex, age, and or species. When the white male, see, when the, when the white female figured out how angry it made her, the white male that if they indulge in this thing we call sex, that it would produce another mouth that he couldn't feed, she had to find various means to give him the same type of pleasure, right. but at the same time not produce mouths he couldn't feed. Right, right. And so they invented all the different types of sexual things that they did to produce those type of results, even going as far as urinating and defecating on one another doing whatever they could do it, that their mind could process to produce some enjoyment. Well, the white male was a strange creature. He began to experiment like anything. And as he experimented, he realized, hmm, this little girl at five years old, before she reaches puberty, if I engage in sexual activity with her, she won't produce no mouth I can't feed. 
So that became an alternative for him. He went even further and, you know, he used to hunt with Rover. That was his only friend that he had. And he didn't just hunt with Rover. He also experimented and said, I won't produce a half white male, half uh, monster if I go with Rover. So he began to involve himself with sexual activity with animals. And then he went even further and saw that him and uh, uh, Buck Row, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, Loki, two white males can get together, indulge in sexual misbehavior, and the beauty of that was it wouldn't produce a mouth he couldn't feed. But then he reached his zenith, and I don't, I can't pretend to explain to you why this is their zenith. This is history. We'll go and find it out. I'm just reporting the history. But somehow, in the European's mind, the zenith of a sexual encounter for him was with a little boy. And if you study their behavior, what you realize, for Europeans, sex is a matter of sex and aggression. It's not an interchange between two in that way. It is a matter of a sexual aggression. Is there something that I can take, indulge myself in sex, where there's an aggressor and aggressive, a, 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 a victim somewhere in here, an aggressor, and then that's how I get my sexual enjoyment. So it don't matter the sexual objects. It don't matter if it's males or females. And what he liked about the little boy, I suspect, is that unlike the female, the female gets attached to the male based on a sexual encounter. Well, the little male boy didn't have the same thing. He got to a certain age, and then he was a grown male. He had to go out on his own. So he could do that freely. And in his mind, there was nothing to attach that with. Right. And so in the mind of the European, the greatest sense of sexual pleasure they can get is with another male. Right. Mm. And so now we're going to start going because we got to say now, what's the relevance of this? Now let's recap this. We talked about African people. If you want some empirical proof of what we're talking about, the black man and the black woman see each other as complementary partners in the journey of life, look to some of our art. Even though we've been under hundreds of years of oppression of Europeans, right, right. in our art sometimes you can still see the purity. You can still see the love. You look here, you see the brother with the little sister. You don't see nothing sexual in it. You don't see nothing like that. What you see is a caring, nurturing situation. You see the sister, she's happy to be there. They both want to be there. It's warm, it's caring. This is who we are as a people. You see the sister, a nurturer, the little boy is happy. His mommy's there to protect him and, and bring him up, right? This is who we are as a people. But we look at Europeans, we got a very different bunch. Very different. Remember we said sex is viewed by whites as an enjoyable means of pleasure between two entities, regardless of sex, age, and or species. That's why they got Gay Day at Disney. That's right. Crackers going and doing all kinds of things they're doing. Then you see down here Eminem is with this like green monster. Mm -hmm. Now look, don't look at me. I'm not a cracker. Don't ask me to explain it. I just know it ain't right. <laughs> I don't know what they're going to get involved. But this is what's coming out of the Europeans' mind. That's right. And so now we got to start going into the history. This is an ugly place, but we just went an ugly place. But let's just go a little further into the ugly place right. just so you don't think I'm making this stuff up. That's true, right. bro. Body get dark. It's about, to get, it's about to get ugly in here. Let's see what Plato has to say. Y'all have heard of Plato. Roman philosopher. They, 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 they uh, credit him with being one of the greatest minds the Europeans ever produced. I was watching Brother uh, 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 Quasi, uh, uh, the master teacher, at one of his lectures one time, and he pulled this out from Plato's symposium, and it, it shook my whole world because I said, whoa, this is, this is sick. He said, homosexuality, or what they call grown males with little boys, pederasty. Same thing, white sex. Homosexuality alone is capable of satisfying a man's highest and noblest aspirations. And the love between man and woman, when spoken of at all, is altogether inferior. A purely physical impulse whose sole object is the procreation of life. Oh, man, let's go over that again. Say it again, bro. A sexual encounter between two males is capable of satisfying a man's highest and noblest aspirations. In other words, Nothing is greater for the European on the spiritual totem pole. If that's what you want, I don't want to say totem pole. I know the natives saying, why you got a totem pole? Why not the spiritual pyramid? You built pyramid? No. I don't know what you call this, but on the European hierarchy, oh, we got to get some, somebody in here, figure out that's your homework assignment. Come up with a term for the year, way Europeans put this stuff in order. I don't know. But that's what they find the most pleasurable, a sexual encounter with a man. But then here's a war statement that we're going to start to understand. This is a war statement. When they say, he said, the love between man and woman was spoken of at all is altogether inferior. In other words, no male should really want to be with a female. It's just that he has to do that to produce a child. But that's nothing inside of him that wants to do that. So we see sex is a purely physical thing between Europeans, and they think very differently than us. We go further into the research. We look in the book, Moments in the History of Sexuality. 
we going back to the Greeks. These were the earliest whites that they claimed. This is, you know, classical Greek culture, the beginning of white civilization. Well, let's go see what the Greeks were about. Greek, this is chapter one, Greek pederasty and modern homosexuality. In classical Greece, homosexual couples of two adult men were not to be found. Greek texts and bosses show that homosexual relationships normally took place only between adults and adolescents, or between young men and boys. The sexual relationship never were two adult men. Wow. So what are we saying? So we gotta watch, these Europeans over the course of thousands of years have gotten very tricky. They try to always tell us no child molestation and homosexuality are two different things. Right. But based on the absolute history of it, it's not two different things. Right. A grown male with a little boy, the fact that it's two males is homosexuality by itself. The fact that it's an adult and a child is child molestation. We need to change these terms because they're very confusing. What you have is white sex. This is the way Europeans behave sexually. It don't matter if he's with an animal, a boy, a male, or a little girl. It's just European misbehavior. How can you predict a psychopath? How can you predict somebody who operates outside of your understanding? You can't. All you can do is analyze it, put it in the category, and then say this is what we expect from them. That's right. Let's go forward get some more. Greek pederasty and, and homosexuality. This is called the initiation. Now, I want you to understand, this was not something that happened in Greece from time to time. We talk about a cultural norm. Come it's on, not brother. something that every, you know, once every month, on, maybe some European did somewhere. Let's go to the facts. These are written by Europeans. They have a peculiar custom regarding love affairs, for they win the objects of their love, not by persuasion, but by capture. After giving presents to the boy, the abductor takes him away to any place in the country he wishes, and those who are present at the capture follow behind them, and after feasting and hunting with them for two months, they return to the city. Wow. They had it narrowed down so much they knew how long you could keep the little boy, mm -hmm. the little white male. They had things called gymnasiums. That's where they get the term gymnasium. And the little white males would be there nude, and the crackers, these, these, these European Greeks who were married, would go there and see which little white male they wanted to nurture and mentor into white adulthood. Yeah. Mm. That's how this went on. So this was part of the normal culture. Right. You were expected to do that. If you were married and you did not go and mentor a little uh, white male you, people would wonder what was wrong with you. Wrong. Not right. people, you're being. Yeah. Wow. We tend to think of the Greeks as somehow a sexually liberated people. They were not hung up about the same kinds of things that we're hung up about. Uh, they're, they're, Acceptance of sex is a, is, a, is a natural part of life. It's something that um, makes them, at the same time, a very attractive culture and at the same time, a very foreign culture. The lascivious behavior of the elite Greek male was mirrored in the antics of his gods. The all-powerful Zeus was a philandering husband whose sexual appetites ran the gamut from goddesses to mortal women to young boys. Romantic love between men and women was not the norm in classical Greece. Marriages were largely economic arrangements to ensure bloodlines and inheritances. Plato himself sang the praises of love between men in the symposium. The Greeks didn't castigate sexual preference just as we don't castigate people who prefer soccer to football or basketball to hockey or something like that. No, it wasn't a ground of moral judgment. It just wasn't a category. Male homosexual relationships often involved an older man with a younger boy, a practice known as pederasty. Certain subcultures in Greece, particularly the elite subcultures, romanticized the relation between an adult male and a pubescent boy. It was a rite of passage in a sense. There were certain rules of... One of the most famous tales of male homosexual love in Greece is the legend of the sacred band of Thebes. This valiant army of 300 lovers allegedly fought against Alexander the Great and his father at the Battle of Chironia in 338 BC. The young Alexander the Great saw a heap of bodies, uh, beautiful bodies, uh, all piled on top of each other, all dead of honorable wounds. And he asked the subaltern, who are these brave men? And uh, he was told, this, sir, is a sacred band of Thebes. 
and they all died avoiding disgrace in the eyes of their lovers. The defeat of the sacred band of Thebes marked the end of the classical period in ancient Greece and the beginning of the Hellenistic. This dynamic era ushered in many changes in Greek culture, especially in the arena of sexuality. The female nude gradually replaced the male nude as the Greeks' ideal form of beauty. Erotic bonds between men and women strengthened, taking the place of male-male relationships. It seems the wise and learned Greeks had finally discovered the humanity of woman. Let's go to Western, there's a book called Western Sexuality. Homosexuality in ancient Rome, uh, uh, this is what they say about Plato. It does not seem to have crossed his mind that one could be in love with a woman. We go even further. He says, homosexuality in ancient Rome. Uh, a much repeated way of teasing a slave is to remind him of what his master expects of him. To get down on all fours, the fasting Panastini, the 25th of April in Roman calendar, was the festival of the male prostitutes. Mm. Why well, I put this up here? When we walk down the street and we see these males today dressed in females' clothing, you know, we look at it and try to figure out what in the world is going on. The furthest thing from our mind would have been that this is something that has been going on with Europeans, that they've transferred to us, that's been going on for thousands of years, that's part of their culture. Very important. This was a world in which one's behavior was judged not by one's preference for girls or boys, but by whether one played an active or passive role. Mm. To be active was to be male. The important thing is to be the ravisher, never mind the sex of the victim. Mm. What are they saying? Well, Europeans, once again, we go back to our point. Sex is not, in the mind of a European, sex is something where there's a victim and there's an abductor. Where somebody is a perpetrator and somebody is taking something, somebody is active, and that means being male. So in the mind of a European, there's nothing wrong as long as he's forcing his will on something else. It does not matter what it is. There's nothing to talk about. That's what he's supposed to do. He's male. And the person that's wrong is the victim. So that's where you get the whole blaming the victim mentality. Because that's the one that did something wrong. The one who was violated. With right. African people, it does matter. If you do anything outside of a sexual encounter with a, a woman, a man and a consenting woman, there's a problem. There's a problem right? And so we see things very, very differently than uh, Europeans. Hadrian was married to a woman named Sabina the great niece of the Emperor Trajan. But it was a loveless marriage. Hadrian complained to friends that Sabina was moody and difficult. Sabina swore she would never bear him children by publicly announcing her use of contraceptives. Like many emperors before him, Hadrian remained childless. Sabina's coldness toward her husband may have been due to his infidelity. Hadrian was said to have passions for men rather than women. The ruler began an affair with an 18-year-old boy named Antinous, whom he met during his travels through Bithynia, which is now Turkey. In the Roman world, the term homosexual didn't exist, and the concept didn't have the same ramifications that it has today. Um, sex with other men, as long as you were the active partner, was perfectly acceptable, and wealthy Romans had around them not only slave women, but also handsome young slave boys with whom they would use for their sexual pleasures. That was quite common. Sexuality is oftentimes an exchange of power. It's uh, largely a question of which partner is on top. So that in a homosexual affair, it's the submissive partner who sort of loses status. This means that if a Roman citizen were to have homosexual sex with a slave, uh, there's really no problem there. You're simply using your property. However, if a Roman citizen were to play the submissive role, this is a loss of face and may be used as a scandal. So now we got to talk about, okay, we know about the African people. You talked about that. We learned about Europeans. Now, how did African people who come out of one mindset end up participating in this? How do we end up in this scenario? How do we end up not being able to identify white sex as something white? and end up participating in so-called lesbianism and homosexuality and all this white sex. What happened? 
Well, let's talk about it. Let's start with this individual here. There's another term I want you all to remember. It's called small hat. Yeah. And the term small hat refers to whites who commonly refer to themselves as Jews. They practice a religion called Zionism. They say it's Judaism. That's right. Ashkenazim. It's another term. We call them small hats. And the small hat suffices to say, you got other lectures that can talk about this, but uh, like uh, terrorism one and terrorism two, if you want to know more about small hats and what they do. But suffice it to say, to sum it up, it's the worst of the worst of the Europeans. Yeah, right, right. The worst white group of all white groups is these whites who call themselves Jews. And I know for a lot of brothers and sisters who are Christian or what have you, you say, oh, I don't, I don't agree with that. That's okay. Go do the research for yourself or come on back next time we do terrorism part one and part two and you'll understand why. But let's talk about this small head named Christopher Columbus who changed his name from Christopher to Colon. Right. He was actually a small head and he came to the Western Hemisphere. Now why do we want to talk about it? Because we want to say, if we ask the question, how did we get to participate in this, we have to talk about the Atlantic slave trade. And who was the individual who was largely responsible, who had a major part in creating the need for an Atlantic slave trade? Let's talk about so-called Christopher Columbus and what he did when he got to the quote-unquote New World. When Christopher Columbus got to the New World, according to reports of Bartholomew Las Casas and various other Europeans who were here, they would come, and when the red people ran out of gold, he would start chopping their hands off. If you don't have gold, we'll chop your hands off. Yeah, the same Christopher Columbus that on October 12th they just celebrated. Yeah, a couple of days ago, the one that was celebrating this country, this is what he did. But he went further. They would take people in all kinds of tortures. They brought these man-eating dogs in from Spain who had been taught and trained to rip the stomachs open of the victims of human beings and then lick the intestines out and eat them through. So they would literally go and chase the natives into the forest, right. the Arawaks, and take their babies and use them as feed food for the dogs. Yeah. This is what the small hat Christopher Columbus had done. Uh, he also would do what they call impaling. They would have these long iron sharp rods and they would take human beings while they were alive and sit them down through the anus and have the spike coming up through their head. This is what happened to them. Right there in Haiti, brothers and sisters. Right there. Right there. And then, uh, I mean, they would do just countless things. They would have these huge giblets, big, big wooden giblets. And they would hang 13 or 14 individuals at one time. And then they would make a wife stand out and watch her husband being hung. And at the same time, watch another European take her baby by the ankles and bash his head against a tree till the brain splat out and then feed him to the dogs. Sometimes they would even have these the roasters that they put pigs on and they would uh, uh, put the baby through that and then put it over the fire and roast the babies and eat the baby. These are all factual accounts. You can read them for yourself. This is the individual who we call so-called Christopher Columbus. Just had a holiday. Just had a holiday. Now, he killed so many of them, and once the Europeans found out about the Western Hemisphere, they began to kill so many of the red people that Christopher Columbus, who, was, who used to travel during the Portuguese slave trade up and down the west coast of Africa, said, you know what, we're probably going to end up exterminating these individuals here. Right. Why don't we go and replace that labor with a foreign labor base who can't hide, they don't know the terrain. Let's go to Africa and get some of them. Mm. And so it's because of, of, of so-called Christopher Columbus, Cristobal Colon, this small hat, that the necessity for getting Africans to do this came about, to come in for the slave trade, to do the work for the Europeans. Now let's just talk about a few things about Cristobal Colon, and we'll move forward. One, he was a flaming homosexual. Right. Two, he was a child molester and a child killer. In his reports, when he would write in his diary what he thought about uh, 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 natives, he said, oh, I love to look at the naked uh, um, uh, 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 natives. They're so beautiful. The most beautiful males I've ever seen. That's what he said. Mm. He's the most beautiful naked men I've ever seen. And then he would have uh, 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 certain groups, once he cornered them, he said, listen, turn over all your children, boys and girls under 12, turn them over to my men as sex slaves, or all of you will be uh, eliminated. And of course, some groups refused to do it and were wiped out, and other groups turned it over to try to buy them some time and find some weapons and fight back. So this is the type of individual. So when you think of small hats, when you hear the whites who call themselves Jews, when you watch the television, one who's pr producing all the stuff, right. I want you to remember Crystal Ball Cologne. Right. The next time you think some Jew is your friend or these are God's chosen people, right. that don't sound like no God of mine that would choose nobody That's like right. this. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh -huh. And so now we got to start talking about what happened to us. Okay, we talked about them. We talked about the execution of the natives. 
And let's not forget that sexual theme of sex and, and aggression with Europeans. Hundreds of millions of African people stripped of our names, of our dignity, stripped away from our families, thrown in the holes of slave ships, dragged across to these places that we now call the Americas. Hundreds of millions, brothers and sisters. Countless black bodies. The DNA, if you check the DNA of the Atlantic shark, it's got to have African blood. It's got to have something resembling us because they ate so many of our ancestors who were thrown overboard. Right. We got to start. Under, but what happened specifically, as we're talking about sexual themes, what happened to us to change us from the people who we were? These are the diagrams of the slave ships. You can right. just see how they were packed. You would be in like a sardine, like a can, just like this, where you could barely breathe, and brothers and sisters might even claw each other's brains out. Right. Just to try, just to try and, 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 and survive, to get some oxygen, because of course, under those circumstances, you can't breathe. Now I want you to imagine, brothers and sisters, we're going to take a trip and understand what our ancestors went through. It's a, it's a horrible trip where we stripped from our families. We taken by a wicked slave master and they put us on ships, put us in the holes of ships where we can't even breathe. Some brothers are so sick and sad being in the holes of these ships that they, they don't even want to live, so they don't want to eat. And so the Europeans say, no, no, if you don't eat, you'll die. And I got to sell you at the top price on the, on the market. So they bang his teeth out with metal chisels and then stick a funnel down and feed the pig slop. Brothers and sisters lying next to one another, listening to the screams and moans of his daughter or his son or his mother or, so, or, 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 or her son as they're raped or brutalized or beaten. Sisters are taken up to the top tier. And 30 or 20 or 30 Europeans might all rape her right there, ejaculate her right there. And then if she gets so sick and crazy she can't take it, maybe she jumps overboard. And so the Atlantic shark begins his new route that he begins to take and migrate in a whole new route because they learn the routes from the slave ships because they know that there'll be fresh African meat for them as they travel along these seas. Can you imagine the depths of the ocean, brothers and sisters? Can you imagine what it'd be like being a black woman who's always been respected and revered, being treated in ways that you can't even possibly imagine? Can you imagine being a black man so helpless that you have to sit and listen to the abuse of your women and your children while you can do nothing? This is where the beginning of the feminization process occurs. Don't forget that on these ships, these Europeans weren't only raping uh, black women. They was raping little boys. His highest and noblest aspiration. They were raping grown men even. What you gonna do? Yeah, they ain't gonna do it to me. What you gonna do with chain at your legs and chain behind your arms? If somebody got sick or was too rebellious, they just pick you up and throw you overboard into the depth of the ocean to be eaten by sharks. It was nothing. This is us beginning to turn into a whole nother people. When we got to America, we didn't know that they had these things called sex farms. And on these farms, a grown white males would come and they could purchase our women. So they would come and our women would be used like, like merchandise. And they could come up and fill our women where they had no sense of their bodies and no ability to protect themselves. And they would always get a black male who was effeminized, no longer does he see himself as the protector of the black woman. And he would go around and say, hey, look what I got. Almost like a mannequin. Look, you want this type? Look what she got available for you. Right. Oh, this, these are the kind of things she does. No. Oh, do you want this one? No, oh, do you want this one? Yeah. These are the type of things they did to us where we had no control over our own bodies, no control over what we did. And a black man didn't exist in the way he existed at home where we protected our women and our children. No, we had to sit by on a day-to-day -day basis and watch them totally humiliate us. But not only did we watch them humiliate us, we had to participate in our own destruction and humiliation. So we began to cover these type of jobs where we could go around and show our women off. We began to take joy in doing them because we didn't feel that there was anything left. And so we were made into monsters. Yes, but you know, the white male, the women, you know, the women is cool that he could come and buy women, but he likes things a little different. 
that's not really his taste. If it's going to be a female, he would prefer a little girl. We talked about his development in the caves and hills of Europe. So they had sections of the sex farm with just little girls between the ages of 8 and 18. And they would dress the little girls in scantily dressed clothing and make the little girls dance around and gyrate. And while they would shake, tell them to shake their behinds. And they would always have the most well-dressed black male on the, on, on the sex farm. He had his high hat and his suit. He was the best dressed brother in the place. And he would stand there with the sisters and he would gyrate while these little girls would gyrate and show their bodies off for these grown white males to come and purchase them. That's right. And this is the kind of thing that we went. And I know we're so far removed from slavery that we can't really imagine no black man standing around gyrating, showing our sisters off, little girls and our women, as some type of sex objects for grown males, mm -hmm. dressing our little girls up as if they're some type of sex meat market or what have you. Yeah, right. I know we're so far removed from the slave plantation that our minds can't fathom that. But I want you just to try to imagine being so effeminized that you don't see yourself as the protector of your women. Right. Instead, you see yourself as the salesman of the sexual exploits for our women. Yeah. I want you to imagine being in a circumstance like that. Can you imagine black man standing before the world saying, here are our women. Look at her shake her thing. Yeah. Look at her, show herself, she's really a sexual object. Do you want her? That's right. How much do you want to pay for this one? Mm -hmm. Well, brothers and sisters, we got to be real careful. Because if we don't watch it, well, we think oh. we work. Yeah. Come on with that. We might find ourselves having our women being faceless and nameless, gyrating before the world yeah. as the sexual tools mm. for the Europeans. See, Negroes always talk about slavery being over, but Negroes don't read. So the Negroes don't know what slavery was. And if you don't know what slavery was, and if you don't know what happened during slavery, Negro, you don't know when it's over. How do you know when it's over? How do you know when it's over? I mean, can you imagine, I know you can, us selling our women to white males and they can buy her like bread off the, off the uh, uh, in, a, in the exchange, going to the market, and she's some meat. It can just be bought and sold. Mm -hmm. You see, that's what we were doing, brothers and sisters. Yeah. That's where we've been. But see, we've forgotten. Yeah. So consequently, all of the damage that was done to us during this time has us in a state now, a very frightening state, where we actually see it as acceptable yeah. Yeah, to show our women off just like we did on those sex farms yeah. as sexual toilets and play toys for white males yeah. or anybody who wants them. Anybody. That's an effeminized black male yes, because he's been stripped of the inside that made him a man That's right. that told him that it's my job to protect our women. That's right. That's right. I want you to imagine where that leaves us, brothers and sisters. What gets us in this condition that we're doing today, where we are today is where we were yesterday. And we think that we've come a long way because we don't know the sexual types of things they were doing to us. And consequently, we're destroying ourselves before the world. We're telling the world that we want to be destroyed. Yeah. We're telling the world that our women are here for sexual exploit. That's what they're here for. Yeah. And we're not men because we're not here to protect them. That's we're right. here as salesmen to sell them to you. That's right. And I want you to look at these images because they're the same images. Same. But it gets even worse because you know, the cracker, you know, little girls is cool, you know, grown females are cool, but his highest and noblest aspiration to be with that little boy. That's right. I mean, that's where it all started from. I should say the beginning of it was with the little boy. So if you went on a slave plantation, the white males who really wanted to get down and dirty, they would go to a different section of the slave plantation. Mm -hmm. They would go to the section of the plantation with the little boys. That's right. And our little boys would be dressed up in earrings and makeup. And the white male would go around, oh, oh, this is the one I like, oh. And, and they would be made to act as females That's right. and presented right. as females. Don't talk about that. And the whites would oil our bodies up, the little boys up, little boys. and make up, put the makeup on them and the earrings and sell them on the meat market. This is the feminization of black people where the whites begin to see us through their own sick, sorted eyes. And then we begin, under the system of slavery, to act those very things out. These are the things they did to us. That's right. And so, can you imagine black men, us walking crackers around, 
showing off black males and black children as sexual objects to the world. This is what we did. Our little girls and little boys. So our whole minds are being devastated. And like I said, if you don't know where you've been, then you can't quite recognize where you are. Can you imagine the day that we could take children and make them look like they're adults, ready for sexual exploit, and be acting these things out before the world and saying little black babies are really adult, and they can do adult things, which means they're ready for any sexual exploits that you might have. Our own children, if we don't know where we've been, we don't know where we are. We don't know what we're heading for. But I tell you what, it only gets worse because see, those little black boys who were molested and raped in that way, well then they get older. And so they had something for those little boys. They had a specific job for those little boys. These little boys were on that plantation, on these sex farms. Once they became older, because all they knew was pain and savage hurt, they were then taken to places called uh, uh, breeding farms. And they were put in stables, in a stable like you would put a horse. And so they, their minds were, were, were devastated. And they would think like, like, like you would be on a savage level. And so these little, so, so these little boys who have been savagely raped were now used for the purposes of taking young black girls. She may be 12. She just reached puberty. She just began to have her cycle, and the white male plantation owner wants her to have what he called pups. So that she could have pups, he would take her to the breeding farm. And they would go to the breeding farm, and it would be brothers, just like brothers behind jail cages. And the brothers would be reaching out from behind the cages. And they would say, I want her. She said, I want her. I want to break her in. I can get her pregnant. I can get her some pups. I make twins. I make twins. Because see, these little boys were devastated on those things. Now they're, they're, they're nothing but sick. Yep. So the white male would say, who do you want? Oh, I got a good one for you. Bring the little girl on. Yep. And they would stand around while this black grown male would savagely rape and impregnate this little girl. And this is what we were made into, brothers and sisters. This is how we were sexually violated. And these are the type of monsters that whites made us into. And the white whale would just stand there with his sick self and watch the whole process and say, yeah, you're doing a good job, Buck. While this grown black male who's savage in his mind because of a crime that happened to him, a rape and a molestation that's so deep in his mind that he can't imagine, that now he goes like the monster that he was made and he does it to our little girls. And so we have a savage cycle of sickness and crazed madness in our race that was inflicted on us by a group who hates us. By a group of individuals who we can't be holding hands with and thinking that they're our friends. Because they made us think that we were special and that we were something special, that we were some kind of hero when we could savagely rape our own little girls. Hmm. If we're not careful, brothers and sisters, yeah. if we're not careful, I know it might sound crazy, but we'll find ourselves celebrating and, and appreciating and thinking that Individuals are cool who savagely rape our daughters today. That's what we'll do. You know him, don't you? Oh, we celebrate him. He doing some black girls. But the same thing that happened on the slave plantation of yesterday is happening right before our very eyes. So this is what we have gone through that puts us in this sick state of madness that we find ourselves in today. I know that was a tough journey. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. I don't know, bro. I don't know. That's a tough journey. But that's the journey we've been on. That's the journey. That's a white journey, bro. See, yeah, that, that's a white journey. See, be very cautious. Next time a Negro tells you, forget about slavery, you tell that Negro, I don't think you know nothing about slavery. That's right. Tell him, you can't forget about nothing that's still going on. Right. Because, see, they claim that slavery is over. But what we didn't realize what we were really in, it wasn't just slavery we were in. We didn't know what was going on. Got this picture here because I think, I think it really sums it up. This is the Europeans drawing a slave plantation. Now you know crackers lie, but if you know how to look at them and if you understand them, you know how to find the truth. Now we see here a brother, obviously a rebellious brother, didn't want to just tolerate whatever Europeans were telling him mistreatment. So he get ganged up, tied up to this pole, 
You see the European pull him down naked? Got his buttocks showing right there. Got a black man assisting in the process. That's right. But I want you to key in on the European showing you who he really is. Because you see the cracker laying up on the hill, right? Mm -hmm. See him bare chested in his uh, uh, freakish kind of sordid kind of mind. What do you think happens after this brother gets beat and this cracker leaves and that Negro leaves too? He said, see, this is the sick sexual mentality of the European where sex is not a thing of an exchange between two people. Sex is a form of aggression for them. Right. So that it is not only uh, uh, effeminizing to rape black males, but the object really is to strip any feeling of resistance to white power from them. Right, right. So not only can a man be effeminized as a race, if you're no longer feeling resistance to mistreatment, you have been effeminized. Yeah. You have begun to take a passive role right. in everything. Right. And that's the object down here. That's and see, if we look at this, we say, well, slavery's over. That's what we but say. we don't read, do we? No, we don't. But we don't read close enough. We don't know our crackers. So you got to know your crackers. Yeah. Yeah. Know your crackers. Always know your crackers. That's right. 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Now, you can't say I made this one up. Did I write the Constitution? No, I want a Negro to tell me that I made this one up. <laughs> then you can say I made something, but to tell me I wrote the damn Constitution. Yeah, <laughs> Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, where the party shall be duly convicted, shall exist within the United States. Hmm. Did it outlaw slavery? No, no it didn't. No. It said we're going to replace the slavery system with a prison system. Come on, I, right there in the Thirteenth Amendment. You about to go somewhere, bro? Are we going somewhere? Because that's where we at. Yeah. Uh oh. Right there. Mm. It ain't over. The same said these crackers and these damn prisons, yep. telling black men to bend over and ramming his damn finger. What kind of sick ass freak? You couldn't pay me enough money. I would be hungry that night. I'm not going to no job with my job is that you're going to actually convince me as a grown-ass man yep. there's a legitimate reason for me to be putting on some goddamn gloves yep. and sticking my finger in the rectum of anybody. That's right, That's right. That is some, I mean, I'm going to be, and these men, what kind of sick mind creates a system right. where you bring men in and you find a good reason to strip them naked, get them to bend over and put a finger in their behind, mm -hmm. to strip search them, because you think they did something wrong. What does them being naked have to do with them right. having done something wrong? Talk about it, bro. It's the sex and aggression. They're not trying to find nothing. They're trying to take something. Right. Right. They're That's trying right. to take your resistance. Right. 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 And one of the ways they take resistance is through sexual conquest. Right. I've been through this whole thing. I've been through, I'll never forget, I was uh, arrested. I mean, for nothing. I didn't do nothing. Right. They didn't even, when they wrote a ticket, they didn't have a reason. Mm. And it took me to the prison, and I was, I was, Guaranteed I was going to fight. I said, we, we going to fight. There ain't no strip search going on up here. <laughs> and there was some crackers, about six crackers, and two Negro pigs right down in the jail. And I was ready. I mean, this cracker, one of the rest of me came up and said, give me your belt. And I, you know, I squared up with him. He was like, yeah, and I looked him in the face. I said, I, said, I ain't telling you no more strip search. He said, well, you're going to do the strip search. Then I never forget. He started yelling to all the, hey, we got a cowboy in here. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. And all these I mean, I've never seen that. It was like something out of a lynching. Mm. Oh, oh, we got a cowboy here. Mm. And I was like, I don't care what these crackers say. I mean, you know, I kind of figuring that the, because they black, I'm thinking that the inside is a little bit black. Yeah. Right. I'll never forget where I broke. This is the straight up, I broke. Mm. This nigga looked at me and said, hey, it's probably half a woman. Mm. Oh. Mm. And I said, wait a minute, I'm up here gearing up, hyping myself up about to bang me some crackers out. Mm -hmm. I lose a couple of men, I break an arm, a leg, or something, but I can maintain my dignity. That's right. right, right. And somehow, in this Negro's mind, the concept comes to his mind that something about me and being a female. Right, right, right. I did not understand that then, and what I can, all I can say about that, that's a sick individual. Yes, sir. That ain't the one you want to uh, you know, place your bet on. At least I ain't want to do it that night. I said, this is a problem. It went on, and eventually I got strip searched, and I watched, and I, and I learned a lot from that experience. Mm -hmm. Because I still feel guilty today. I know it sounds crazy because I didn't do nothing. Right. But let's talk about, yeah, yeah, let's talk about what happens to a black man and a black woman when they're sexually abused. Mm. Okay, come on. I tell you, so you can understand kind of why I still feel guilty. Like I let something slide that I owe somebody for something. Come on. Like I, like I was less than a man because something happened to me and I feel guilty about it. I, I, I literally sit around some nights and say, 
and this is a problem. I should do something about this tonight. But I know there's a greater good to be done. Right. But I really know I'm supposed to do something well. What happens to the little boy who's molested? Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the alternative. There's really basically three things that's going to happen. Oh. One of them always happens. Uh -oh. Dysfunction. There it is. There's nothing that can be done. It is a dysfunctional thing. It goes straight to the core of the human being. It goes to your soul. Skip past the spirit. Skip past your intelligence. It goes to the soul. Because a boy is supposed to be nurtured and go through things that make him a man. When you go that deep into the soul and strip that away, you create a dysfunction that never, ever, ever just ceases. The person, for the rest of their life, has to fight against that. Right. So in some area of their life, they're going to experience dysfunction. Right. Yeah, they may look functional to people on the surface. That's because most of us are dysfunctional. Right. But <laughs> on some level in their life, right. somewhere in their life, even if it's just in their own mind, mm -hmm. they're going to struggle with things that the rest of us don't struggle with because something happened to us yep. that didn't happen to the rest of the people. That's, right. Right. That's the best case scenario. The best case scenario is that you can have a man out here that's doing well, living his life, and suffering the type of internal pain that you and I, right. who have not suffered it, would never be able to imagine. Mm -hmm. That's the best case scenario. Mm -hmm. Then we have the other scenarios where somehow, and this is just observing the process, somehow, that's why these prisons are so dangerous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why this European is so, somehow the act of raping a male at a young age, or even an older one, strips his sense of him being a man to such a hard degree that he surrenders to the idea of him just being a woman. Yeah, yeah. The idea is that something has happened to me so much that I no longer can claim my manhood. Right. And so consequently, he goes about participating in sexual deviance. Now remember, he's going to have dysfunction. But now he's on a whole other level of dysfunction right, right. because he's creating repetition out of the crime and the thing that happened to him. So he starts to participate in so-called homosexuality, see himself as a homosexual, when in fact, he's a victim. And the last and most insidious and horrible thing that can happen is that he begins, now that he was violated, to adopt the white sex mentality, the predatory mentality. And so now, sex becomes an aggressor and a victim. Right. Yeah. And so he begins to prey on children yeah. Yeah. and go around the community or wherever he can find children and molest them. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the impacts that it can have. Connection. One of those three are all of them. So if you find somebody who's been sexually abused, a black man, and he ain't doing one of them other two, you got your strong black man who's made it. Because after that, you ain't supposed to make it. Yeah. God ain't make no planet where no man was supposed to be sexually ravaged as a child by another right. man to make it. That's an incredible uh, thing for somebody to be able to do. What happens to our sisters? Mm. Let's talk about our sisters. Talk about it, bro. A black woman, the way it's supposed to be is that at some point in her life, she's supposed to make the decision, I'm going to share myself with someone. Mm. And that gives her a level of security, mm. that's right. value, because she made a decision right, that's right. to be with someone, to share something special with someone. That's something that takes a lot for a woman to come to that conclusion, is that she's ready to do That's a lot. Some people don't do it, some sisters didn't do it well into their adulthood. Just when they were ready. So it, 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 it's the way it's supposed to be. Well, when you see this sister who sexually abuses a child, a few things. One, she feels dirty. That's right. She feels dirty because somebody made her dirty. If you threw me in some cow manure, I'd feel dirty. If you made me ride home in it, I'd feel dirty. Well, guess what? All day, every day, she has to go around. Some male has been with her, never know what kind of disease he might have left her with. Yeah. Never know the kind of things he did to her, but she didn't even know about sex or was not ready to participate in that. Mm -hmm. He's committed all kinds of things to her, so she no longer feels valued. Mm -hmm. So many times she'll go out and start creating repetition and doing it over and over with all the different guys she can find because part of her wants to find a place where it finally becomes comfortable. That's right. That's right. And somehow she thinks that through repetition, with this guy or this guy somewhere that she'll get that feeling that's supposed to feel right and everything will be all right and that soul, that hole in her soul will close, but it don't work that way. She's a victim. We call her a whore. Yep. We call her a stripper. Yep. Don't understand why she feels the way she feels, but we don't know what happened. Yep. We're not putting the pieces together. Let's talk about what else can happen. Sometimes sisters, because it was a, a black male, uh -oh. and they're in our community, they turn us into monsters. So now it's usually a black male that's raping her. Right. When she sees a male that's sexually abusing her, when she sees another black man, that's the same thing she sees. 
So her mind says black men are sexual predators on children. That's what black men become. And so consequently, she becomes, begins to indulge in a warfare against black men. Not intentionally, but because she's been abused by a black man. The black man was a protector, wasn't a protector, he was an abuser. Right. And in her mind, that's what black men represent. Right. So when you go to her and tell her the white race is the devil, she says, that's foolish. I've seen the devil face to face. He was nothing white about it. And so she begins to indulge in warfare with black males. Yeah. You can also find a sister who goes out, and especially nowadays, because of all the things that Europeans are telling us and exposing us to, she has a new alternative. If it don't feel right, sex don't feel right with a male, then I can turn, with a black man, then I can turn to a white male, mm -hmm. or I can turn to a female. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so she begins to indulge in that type of sexual, and it takes some time, it'll take years before she finally realizes, why have I been so dysfunctional in my life? Yeah. Why have I had so much pain? Yeah. Why have I had so many arguments with black men? Why have I done X, Y, and Z? Why do I make all the decisions? Why haven't I been able to have a stable relationship? What's going on? It's because there's a pain that has not been fixed in me. It hasn't been dealt with. It's a hole in the soul. Yeah. Look. Even for those of us who haven't been sexually abused, I know this is heavy, but we're going through the same thing as a race. Yes. That's we were raped as a race. That's right. So we're still trying to find that security as a people right. to do something on our own. Yeah. That's right. right. And that same impact that it has on the individual has on the entire race. Yes, sir. So we're literally going around here, crackers making the food, they're making the clothes, they're doing everything. Because yeah. we still haven't got back on our feet and said we're men. Right. We're women with dignity. We haven't put no clothes back on. We haven't said we're responsible for our women. Right. We haven't said these are our men and we're going to make them strong and we're going to support them. Yeah. We haven't gotten back together again mm -hmm. and gotten strong. Jeez, so just like the victim of the abuse, you go around in a cycle of confusion until at some point in your life you begin to deal with it. It has to be dealt with. Yeah. It doesn't fix itself. Right. And so I said I was saying that to just describe some of the things that go on people's mind. Now, I feel guilty that I let a cracker do that to me because in some ways, it's something that's not supposed to happen to a man. Right, right, bro. So I sit up there, so imagine what's going on in the mind of a 30-year-old black man who was abused as a 5-year-old or a 10-year-old. Mm -hmm. Imagine him. Yeah, he wasn't a man back then, but he feels like he was responsible because he's a man now. And he should have done something. So he's trying to just, no, nah, see, we, we got a problem here. And we got to fix it. Let's go after this. We got a problem because... This is what the Europeans are creating all around the world. Right. And they want homosexual havens. All, they want white sex havens all around the world. And as much as I don't like me no sand crackers, I'll tell you what. They went over to Iraq. Right now. right now. And I, like I said, let me, let me make it clear. I don't even like no herbs. This is hard to do. I'm going to tell you like this. Every night I go to sleep, I pray that them herbs cut them so more cracker heads. Cut them heads. Yes. I'm going to tell you. Yes. They got these prisons. Right and this is the sex farm right there in Iraq where they taking Arab males. Yeah. They ain't never heard of homosexuality. Right. Putting bags over their head, making them indulge in sexual misbehavior. They gang raping Arab women. Yeah. A woman who has never touched another man but the man she was told to marry. Ain't never experienced nothing like that. If you herbs, I'm going to tell all you herbs. If it's an Arab listening, uh -oh. keep cutting them goddamn crack heads. Cut them heads. Yeah. It works. It works. Don't nothing work better than a sawed off cracker head. Yeah. You want to send a cracker thinking all your marching and picking signs? No. But you get you a blade, get it right underneath that, uh, what was that called, brother? You a doctor? Esophagus thing, one of them things, start sawing off anything, and crackers start thinking. And you better keep cutting, or you're going to be just like the rest of the world. I'm going to tell you like this. I know some people say, but man, the Arabs not our friends either, but you know what? We don't need no more white sex havens on this planet. That's right. That's right. So look, we want them Arabs to jog your heads, keep cutting them heads. Cut them babies' heads too. Cut them heads. Cut them yeah, the babies grow up to be adult crackers, so right. you ain't never had no big snake that wasn't a little snake, so if right. you find right. something white, right. kill it. If you find something white, kill it. Look, y'all did that, not me. I gotta keep it real. You asked for us to outside felt that anyway. That's going to get If you find something white, no. Some of y'all shouldn't brush your teeth in the morning because they get too white and might get killed. Just kill it. Just let the cracker know that that's what it's like. If you come over there, you got to die. That's the only way you're going to do it with it. Then what are we talking about? Well, if it wasn't just slavery, then what were we really dealing with? 
Ain't nothing changed. It's a system called racism and white supremacy. That's right. What is racism and white supremacy? Racism and white supremacy is a system developed by whites to conquer, exploit, and annihilate all non-white people on planet Earth. Right. Repeat that after me. Racism and white supremacy is a system developed by whites to conquer, exploit, and annihilate all non-white people from planet Earth. This is what we're living in. We're living in a world conceived in the mind of the European where everything that's not white is going to get its chance to survive. And you're going to be under assault by this race, and they're going to do everything they can to destroy you mm. if you're not white. And that's a worldwide system. Yes, sir. So this thing that we see white sex, what is it? It's just part of the system of racism and white supremacy. Right. If you break down all human behavior into different categories, one of the categories we have is called sex. All we see with rape, child molestation, and other forms of white sex is racism, white supremacy, as it relates to sex. Right. What Europeans are going to do to the world sexually mm -hmm. to accomplish their final goals of annihilating those people. Mm -hmm. So let's see what kind of assault we under. Let's go to 1972. This is the gay rights platform mm -hmm. of 1972. It was a platform drawn up by 200 so-called homosexuals in Chicago at a meeting of the National Gay, Co uh, uh, gay Organization, Coalition of Gay Organizations. They got together and said, what are our agendas? What do we want to get accomplished? We're just going to talk about three of these things on the agenda. This was 72, and tell me if you've seen some of these in fruition today. Federal encouragement and support for sex education courses prepared and taught by gay women and men presenting homosexuality as a valid, healthy preference and lifestyle and a viable alternative to heterosexuality. Repeal of all laws governing the age of sexual consent. Remember we said you're trying to separate so-called homosexuality and child molestation? No. If you're not interested in having sexual contact with a child, why are you interested in repeal of all laws governing the age of sexual consent? Oh, right. yeah. yeah. oh, you're a tricky cracker, but you ain't that tricky. You got up early this morning. Look at that. knew he was going to a PKV function. Right? No, no. Brother. It's all there if you want to know. Enactment of legislation so the child custody, adoption, visitation rights, foster parenting and the like shall not be denied because of sexual orientation or marital status. Right. So what is their goal? What is their agenda? What, what's going on? Is they hitting us from all angles? We go, we're talking about federal encouragement and support for sex education courses. We go to Howard University. Every second Thursday of the month from... I hate you. Yeah. No. Matter of fact, it's not just Howard University. Let me tell you. All over the country. All over the country. And black colleges and institutions. Yep. You have organizations, so-called gay organizations, white sex organizations on the college campuses. Yeah. Let's see what this flyer says. They want them, uh, this is being advertised at Howard University Blackburn Center. Yeah. Got a naked black male sitting on a log. I remember how being young and black and gay and lonely felt. A lot of it was fine, feeling I had the truth and the light and the key. But a lot of it was purely hell. And they said, come on out. No longer invisible. A discussion on being black and gay in America, promoting so-called homosexuality. Yeah. This is what our children are getting when they go to college. What about child molestation? We talking about repeal of all laws governing the age of sexual consent. You better start paying attention to your TV shows. Watch your Boston Public yep, you better pay attention. with your cracker teacher messing with the little child student. Yep. Start watching the little stuff that's going on. Yep. You don't know what's going on, but it don't look right. Let me tell you what's coming. Yep. They've already enforced so-called homosexuality with adults. It is here now. Now the next thing they're promoting is child molestation. This book called Understanding Love Boys. Now they're changing the words. They don't want to be called child molesters no more. They're boy lovers. Yeah, go get them. What's in this book? Mm. The most helpful thing that society could do to improve the mental health of boys in regard to their sexuality would be to simply get out of the way yep. and let them make their own decision mm. with a minimum of interference. In most cases, boys are quite capable of diminishing unwanted attention. You see how these predators operate? Yeah, yeah. They're real sick. Yeah. The boy lover will quite often be involved with boys' activities. That's right. This is simply another aspect of his inherent love for all boys. Mm -hmm. This makes him accessible to a boy who feels a desire and need for an older friend. Mm -hmm. See the trick? Yeah. Yeah. He's not going looking for a little boy. 
Right. There's a little boy that's hunting him now right. and just can't find him. Right. So that he can be accessible to the little boy, that's why he wants to be the coach. Yeah. That's why I'm not hunting them, they hunt me. Yeah. Yeah. Changing the predator to the prey. Wow. Changing the victims of some real chicken oh, crap. Right, but we got up early this morning. That's why we get up early. Adoption for so-called homosexual. <laughs> Enactment of legislation so the child custody, adoption, visitation rights, foster parent and the like shall not be denied because of sexual orientation or marital status. Right. Brothers and sisters, it ain't one or two cases. I want you to understand. These faggots are adopting our children left and right. The slave farm is back. They are buying black children. I want you to listen to what I'm saying. The foster parenting system has always been a haven for child sexual predators. It's a sexual playground for black children. Now, the crackers don't come to play. The crackers come to buy merchandise. Faggots are all across this country. Black faggots, white faggots, 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 faggots are adopting faggots. black children That's like right. you would not believe. Talk about it, brother. What kind of manhood exists in a race where you would let a goddamn faggot tell you you're going to get your child and don't do nothing about it? That's what we call the feminization. But it's everywhere. Everywhere we look, they bombard us with it. So we got to try to figure out, I mean, what else are they doing, brother sisters? They started off with the Flip Wilson. We ain't understand what was going on. Geraldine. Got this Negro dressed uh, uh, like a female, and we don't really understand what's going on. Right. In order for a group to accept its own abuse, you got to get used to seeing it. Yeah. So they want those who have not been sexually abused to start getting mentally and psychologically abused. Right. So you can see what's supposed to be a black man acting like a female, so you get the idea, don't resist. Right. You ain't nothing but a woman anyway. Yeah. No matter how you look on the outside, on the inside, you're nothing but a woman. Right. Martin Lawrence. All this stuff going on, we ain't know what was hitting us. I mean, they hit us with this stuff every chance, six degrees of separation. This, this freak, Will Smith, this is a soft, sorry dude. Yeah, call him out. I got to call him out. I mean, you're going to kiss a cracker on TV, but you ain't a fag. Right. Who you fooling, Slim? Yeah. I'm an African. Yeah, yeah, I was me. born many, I don't remember where I was born. I came a thousand years ago. You can pull that small time stuff yes, over somebody else, yeah. but I'm an African. Yeah. Not me, buddy. You kissing this dude, that does make you a fan. Yes, sir. Just by the nature of the fact that you would let that happen. Yeah. But the crying game. Got a whole juvie with the whole theme about it. Is the surprise at the end is that the guy he's dealing with is a black man, not a black female. I mean, sick. Set it off. Got Queen Latifah. Yeah. Used to be an icon. King Latifah. Yeah. Used to be an icon of the hip hop movement. We thought she was powerful. Ladies first. We ain't know what she wanted to do with ladies first, though. Oh, Color purple. Color purple, that's the banger. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. That's the banger. I want to say to all you sisters, if that's one of the juvies in your stable and you love that, you got some work to do. <laughs> ain't nowhere in the world you can sit by and watch the white race savagely attack your whole character. The women, the men, and the babies that enjoy it unless you're sick. We all sick. These crackers coming like a freight train, 20,000 miles an hour, everything. Pulp Fiction. God damn it, if you ain't never been exposed to no freakish type of thing, you literally sitting out there trying to be entertained, what kind of cracker comes up showing you a black man bent over with an apple in his mouth getting sexually sodomized? Yes, right, Who right. comes up with that? Who comes up with Put stuff in your head that you never think, and it was ring rain. We're going to talk about that tomorrow, too. Yeah, yeah. What does that do? to a group of people who are looking for icons and looking for manhood. Yep, yep. They hitting us the green mile, find some reason why some Negro can grab a cracker's testicle. That kid on us, why do they come up with these things? I mean, some fag sitting down in the room saying, I'm going to make a movie, and I'm going to find a way to get a black man to grab a cracker's testicles, and it's not going to look gay to people, but it's gay. Right. I mean, what's that? You know, I mean, these crackers, they come. Get him, get him, I don't get him. Wesley Snipes, yeah. two more food. Yeah. Where did they come up with the concept of putting Wesley Snipes? You don't do that, you crackers, man. You know. I mean, but it's coming. This is what we're getting. This is the appetite we're getting, brother. Since we know that master teacher, brother Ashra Crazy, says images shape our reality. Yeah. Uh, Lord, Lord. Brother Kush always tells us, these images, we got to watch them. We don't understand it. We, don't understand we become victims. Y'all know him? No. You don't know him like that? Do you know him like this? Uh huh. RuPaul. This is what they're doing. This is what the constant appetite, the constant diet of African people. Now I'm going to make a brief point here. We'll get back to it another time. But I found out something in studying the effeminization of the black race and of the black male that was very interesting. I didn't realize this at first, but effeminization is not just the rape of black men. And there are other things besides sexual contact that denote effeminization. 
One of those things that crackers have found out is that a black man who is with any other woman besides a black woman, and particularly a black man that's with a white female, is lobotomized and feminized in wow. the right. sense yeah. that as a race, on, when we look at a black man, yeah. if he's with a white female, he loses all credibility. He no longer has that essence of manhood no more. It ain't even so, even Negro or Uncle Tom will look at somebody who he says he hates. And if he sees this black man trading on a race with a white female, this Uncle Tom might be married to a white female. He said, look, he's a phony. Because something in our genetic DNA makeup knows that it's wrong for a black man to be with anything but the queen of the planet Earth. It ain't good enough for him, so something is wrong with him to be like that. So every chance they get, they don't just want black males being with uh, uh, males or acting like females. Another thing they do to effeminize us is get us with white females. Integration, by its very nature, is uh, a feminization, a feminizing process. So I want to show you this because I think this says it all. This is Ricky Williams. This is the head of, this is a cover of ESPN magazine. And somebody bring me another. This is Ricky Williams. This is Ricky Williams. He was a. Heisman Trophy winner. He comes out and he's going to play for the Miami Dolphins. Mike Dickers, the white male there you see, is the coach. And they create a, a, a cover, a magazine cover, so they're married together now because they're going to be, he's coaching and he's uh, going to be the player. Now who got on the wedding dress? <laughs> who got on a full wedding? Now I want you to understand what's happening right. in the mind of the children who see strength and manhood through this athletics. Now the message to them is big, how bulky, how strong you think you are. You're nothing but a woman That's right. next to the white male. That's right. You have no reason, thank you. You have no reason or right to think that you can resist. So now we're getting a little deeper because we dealt with the physical rape, but it just goes deeper. We're going to have to stop right here, brothers and sisters, and change the tape. And keep going. That's a good place to stop, man. Just look at that for a minute. And I want you to ask yourself, I want you to remember when you used to watch the Partridge Family. What's the other stuff you used to watch? Uh, when, we, when you were young, all the stuff that used to come on. We wasn't getting the Brady Bunch. We wasn't getting nothing like this, though. Now imagine how all the things we saw when we were young created the mentality that we have today. What are our children going to be like if this is all they see? There's nothing sacred about black manhood. Our children have never seen anything and thought anything was sacred about black manhood. So consequently, they sit around looking on a regular basis, getting a regular diet of seeing black males act in a feminine fashion. Brothers and sisters, these crackers got this whole thing figured out. They know that if they strip the inside of us out, the integrity, the ethics, and the morality, they no longer have to worry about, they don't have to worry about what we read. That's right. They don't have to worry about if, uh, you know, anything else that we do. All they have to do is strip that from us, and they don't have to worry about the decisions we're going to make. Mm. Yes, sister. My question is, all these brothers, all these great brother, brothers that are in making all this, all this type of money, Stop. and that are all in the show business and the sports arena, uh, obvious, obviously, Nobody had trained them because they all end up with white women. When they make the money, they all end up with white women. The groupies follow them all over the place. And they eventually end up with a white woman. Even if they end up in jail because they all eventually are, are, are said that they had raped them or whatever. When they make their money, they don't come back to the community for the sisters. They go back to the, they stay with the white society. So they're the ones that are promoting all that. So what are we going to do about it? I'm glad she asked that question. I want you all to remember a question because I know that once we get to going throughout this process, a lot of those questions we're going to answer. That's a very good question. But the good thing is that we're starting to see we're under attack. And that's the whole object of what we're doing here is for us to see that as a race we're under attack. It's not just a couple of people out here. This guy's not just gay on the side. There's something that's happening that's leading to all this. There's a whole lot more going on than meets the eye. And we're going to deal with some more over here. And we're going to answer some of these questions she's asking. We're going to deal with some over here. Then when we come back tomorrow, we're going to go even deeper into it, much deeper into it. All right. Mm. All right, we're about to be back live now, brother and sister. <laughs>
Right. All right, we're back live. So we see what we're seeing here. We see what's going into the minds of our children, right? right. See what's going into the minds of our people. Like we said, it's like a freight train. They're coming with everything. Now, <coughs> this was real deep because you know how the peckerwood is. Now, the crackers don't have no history of African people being so-called homosexuals. All right, you with me? Yeah. So all the history says this is something that they did in their life. So if they can't have true history saying that African people are so-called homosexuals, you know what they do? They create it. They manufacture it. Right. Let's go see how brazen and aggressive. Now, I want you to understand, it's not just sex and physical aggression. It's sex and all types of aggression, including intellectual, psychological warfare aggression. Right. More aggressive than any other crackers on the planet. The small hats and the homos, nothing can compare with the type of aggression. Heart of Lavender in Search of Gay Africa by Eugene J. Patron. Mm. We will never know if Lucy was a lesbian. Y'all know who Lucy was? Let's see. Okay. The discovery of the famous skeleton in Ethiopia in 1974 by Dr. Richard Leakey was the clearest proof to date to human, of human evolution, evolution beginning on the African continent. Yes, our carbon dating revealed that Lucy lived 3 to 3.7 million years ago. We call it Dick Nish because it wasn't over Lucy's around until them crackers came out of the caves and hills of Europe. So we call it Dick Nish. 3.7 million year old bones of a black woman. Yet, whether she ever lusted after female uh, orthopithecines is a secret that will remain hers for eternity. <laughs> so where there is no history, the cracker supposes that there could have been history. Well, cracker, this is the problem. There were no crackers 3.7 million years ago. There were no whites. Therefore, there was no white sex. How about that? How about that? Let's see. But they don't stop. They're looking the crackers so bad, they'll tell you the truth. By the same time, they're lying to you. Uh -oh. <laughs> if anthropologists and other researchers needed an excuse to avoid the subject, they've only had to point to the widespread denial of homosexual practice by Africans themselves. Mm. Homosexuality is often thrown onto the pile of unwanted debris attributed to the legacy of European and Arab colonialism. In other words, the cracker is trying to find somebody to agree with him that homosexuality is part of African culture. Uh -uh. Ain't no history to prove it. Ain't no black people in Africa want to agree with them. They say, no, that's y'all stuff. That's your stuff. And so now they just start manufacturing this stuff. Manufacturing. Let's see how aggressive these crackers get. Y'all remember him? Yeah. Long before some Iraqis was cutting them crackers up, we had some African brothers, some black men down in Southampton County. They had heard about some black men over in Haiti that had fought the greatest revolution in the history of the world. Right. Took them French and did some things. Wasn't nothing freaky like Europeans do all this funny stuff in Albert Great Prison, but there's a whole lot of killing going on. That's right. So they said, you know what? If they can fight and end slavery by killing some crackers, you know what? We can do the same thing. So this was a black man. I want you to understand something about Nat Turner's character, and I want you to understand why we're about to do it. So it just really brings out the wickedness and the aggression in these white sex offenders. This is a black man who enforced no rape during the course of this rebellion. Right. We're not here for no, we're not here for that. Right. We're here for independence as a free, proud, and productive people. Right. He said, the only thing we're going to do is going to kill everything white and in sight. That's right. And we're going to destroy the system of racism and white supremacy. We're going to destroy slavery because it's wrong. He was a black man who loved black people and was loyal to black people. Right. And so the cracker looked at him historically and said, man, this is not the type of icon we want for black people because he don't have no march against him. We don't know enough about his history to even find nothing. He was the perfect source of black manhood and rebellion. So much so that even crackers don't like him, don't even say nothing because they respect what he did. Right. Frighten him to hell, but respect what he did. <laughs> so Peckerwood named Thomas Gray, when Nat Turner was caught, went and interviewed Nat Turner and wrote a 10-page uh, uh, interview with Nat Turner explaining why he did what he did. Beautiful black man, strong. And so in the 60s, when the uh, civil rights movement was declining and the black power movement was coming in, our brothers and sisters started looking back in history and saying, hey, Nat Turner's one of our icons. Let's use him to get people together, to galvanize. He was a strong brother. He was a soldier. The name of it was The Confessions of Nat Turner, right. the essay that talked about Nat Turner, what he did. Right. So we got this white sex offender named William Styron. Sees the black power movement coming, sees Nat Turner is 
black people just starting to learn about Nat Turner and what he did, he's becoming a black icon. This cracker goes out, writes a homosexual novel, entitles it The Confessions of Nat Turner, the same as the essay, and puts it out on the street and wins a Pulitzer Prize and cracker spread it all around. So now, when you tell a black person, you've ever heard of Nat Turner? Nah, I'm gonna go find it. Black people went out, got this book, start going in the book, and let's see what they took this proud, productive African warrior, general, mostly responsible. There's no single incident that occurred in the United States more responsible for ending the system of slavery than Nat Turner's rebellion. Them crackers went to vote the next month, had a general assembly in Virginia, and voted, and only by like three or four or five votes decided to keep slavery in. By five votes or so, they was about to vote to end slavery after that. That's how powerful an impact Nat Turner had. Let's see what William Styron does. William Styron goes and creates his own homosexual novel as a white sex offender himself. Let's see what he says about Nat Turner. He's talking about him being with another brother as an adolescent. <clears throat> I reached up to wipe away the blood from my lips, pulling him near with the feel of his shoulders slippery beneath my hand. And then we, we somehow fell on each other very close, soft and comfortable, and they sprawl like babies. I mean, that's all kind of cracker fag talk, man. Yeah, yeah. Beneath my exploding fingers, his hot skin throbbed and pulsed like the throat of a pigeon. And I heard him sigh in a faraway voice. And then for a long moment, as if set free into another land, we did with our hands together what before I had done alone. Never had I known that human flesh could be so sweet. Minutes afterwards. Man, I sure did like it. That won't do that again. Oh my God. Oh. An intellectual sodomy. Yeah. Right. An intellectual rape. Where you can't do anything to the legacy of this man for real. Where he was too much man for you to deal with when he was here. Where he sends shivers up your spine when you're here today and tonight. But you have an answer for that. You go another level. You literally change the story turn him into something that is acceptable to you, yeah. and effeminize him intellectually. Yeah. That which you couldn't do while he was alive, brother. Yeah. This is the type of aggression we're facing. Yeah. Let's look at South Africa when we saw our brothers and sisters ready for the struggle. They were ready to fight under Winnie Mandela. They remember the PAC, the Pan-Africanist Congress. They had a tight slogan. They had a good slogan for an oppressive cracker. Right. The cracker was called settlers. Yeah. They said, one settler, one bullet. One bullet. That's right. You got to like that. Get them a round of applause for that. Don't be scared. Sometimes you gotta fight. Look, and even for the brothers and sisters into the yoga and stuff and the conservation, think of it like this. It was a conservation type of thing where they didn't want to use the excess metal, too much metal on one cracker, just a little bit of it. It works for everybody. So even if you're in it, that works for you too. All right? See, they thinking about it all. It's all a circle. That's right. And so, they brothers said, without mass struggle, there can be no revolution. And without armed struggle, there can be no victory. Black people arming themselves, seeing the enemy as white oppression, going after white oppression, fighting white power. Boy, these crackers something else. What's this? <laughs> after they stripped the revolutionary spirit from African people, making all kinds of promises they knew they weren't going to keep, paying Negroes off and what have you. Now the small hats, the white so-called Jews who are in control of South Africa, right. they got a bunch of different groups they're dealing with. Many of them are homosexuals themselves. And they got the Boers, the settlers, and various other groups. So they created this concept in South Africa now, if you go. This is the mural of diversity. Yeah. Mm. And if you go to their cultural centers or whatever, you see this mural of diversity. And I want you to see the science in this, real deep. Before, it was whites on one side, blacks on one side. Us being oppressed, them being oppressed, us arming to fight against whites. Now you got a hodgepodge of Negroes and crackers all dancing and being prancing together. And now the most militant wing of the African, with his Uzi here, is now with the militant group of Europeans, with their AK-47. But now the revolution has changed from fighting white power to fighting for a sexual revolution. Right. Yeah. You ever heard that word before? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. So right now, brothers and sisters, you would not, I cannot, there's not words that I can use to describe to you what it's like in South Africa. Mm. The white sex, it is a, it's a modern day San Francisco. Matter of fact, this is some of the advertisements for it. Look, this is the advertisement on the internet. 
over and above its stunning natural scenery and superb beaches, Cape Town, which is in South Africa, has over 100 gay venues, which includes clubs, bars, businesses, and organizations, making it South Africa's undisputed queer capital. Wow. Brothers and sisters, these crackers are going buck wild. Buck wild. Took our whole idea of revolution and turned it into something freakish. Now you see they got all kind of gay pride parades going on in South Africa and our people all involved. See this Negro here, you see the t-shirt? No liberation without what? Gay liberation. So now your liberation has not become black and white. It's now about a sexual exploit with another male. This is the type of aggression we're dealing with. Brothers and sisters doing plays, butchers, faggots, dykes, all kind of freakish madness going over in South Africa, brothers and sisters. No different than what we see here today. No different. This is a worldwide phenomenon. In fact, the small hats, we talked about the small hats, the whites who call themselves Jews, went so far, now remember we talked earlier, there was no history of so-called homosexuality in Africa, right? right? So now in order to get African people to do it, they got to come up with all kind of creative means by which to do it. So one thing the small hat doctors decided they were going to do, they went out and created a myth and started telling all the traditional healers and everything, look, if you want to be successful in life, and if you want to get rid of AIDS, mm -hmm. what you do is you got to have sex with your child or with a baby, right. a virgin baby, or your own child. Yeah. And if you have sex with your own child or a virgin baby, then to get rid of AIDS and you can be real successful. Well, for people who are oppressed and who don't know no better and who want to do better, now they've gone out and now in Zambia, brothers and sisters, they are raping children at an epidemic rate. Look, about one in five Zambian adults has the HIV virus that leads to the AIDS. Uh, the result has been a surge in reported cases of child rape, particularly in Zambia. Almost every day, Zambian newspapers carrying chilling tales of child rape. Every day. All because some cracker came up with something and our people are not knowing who we're dealing with are going around now. Babies, we're talking about grown adult black men going around raping babies, thinking that that's going to get rid of AIDS for them, or it's going to make them successful. So where well, they didn't have no history of so-called child molestation, no history of homosexuality, now they create the climate. And now, of course, they can go get Negroes now who've gone through this, and now they can find somebody who will agree with them. Yeah, this is part of our culture. Because they've been made sick too. But since they're going out there, who's supporting them? Let's just keep it straight. Yeah. I ain't feeling nice today, you know. Sometimes I feel nice. I ain't. Let's talk about these Christians, man. Yeah. Here you got this Negro Christian uh, preacher here. Desmond Tutu in South Africa mm -hmm. promoting this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa has in the past publicly supported the rights of lesbians and gay men, calling them children of God <laughs> and comparing anti-homosexual discrimination to the apartheid system's treatment of South Africa's black citizens. Yeah. So now we know why we should have never been listening to this Negro in the first place when we were fighting revolution, because he wasn't fighting for a revolution for black people. No, he, wasn't. he was fighting for his gay liberation. Yeah. But not all is lost. What about brothers like Sam and Joma of Namibia? Yeah. Yeah. All necessary steps must be taken to combat influences that are influencing us and our children in a negative way. Homosexuals must be condemned and rejected in our society. Right. That's right, give them a round of applause, that's right. Uh oh, uh oh, that's that fighter. That's right. You like it? He looks strong, don't he? That's a black man right there. Crackers came all in, raping and murdering and torturing. His brother, they took over down in Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, and now he said, you know what? I should have done this a long time ago. Crackers, y'all own 70% of our land, of our fertile soil. You better leave with that. Right. Say, look, I'm not telling the people to take the land back, but they got to eat. So I don't know what's going to happen tonight when you go to bed. Some of them crackers just don't wake up. So the brothers and sisters in Bawe taking their land back, but guess what else he's fighting? He's fighting a full onslaught uh, from Europe trying to promote so-called homosexuality in Zimbabwe. He said homosexuality is a white problem. Tony Blair, who is in, in British, the British cabinet, is a gay mafia. He said, you British homosexuals are worse than dogs and pigs, because at least the dogs and pigs know the difference between males and females. Oh, he ain't playing. He said, the British government is seeking to promote homosexuality. He says, this is all about y'all coming here. But he said, but us, as chiefs, we should fight against such Western practices and respect our own culture. We got to know who we are. He promised that Africa in general, and Zimbabwe in particular, would do everything in its power to combat it.
right? And let me just say to my brothers and sisters in Africa, if I can say anything to you, I implore you. I know this is going to be harsh, so go ahead and hold your stomachs. This is the type of problem that cannot be worked on. It's got to be fixed. Right. Before these crackers get you to the point where they got people in power who gonna promote this, yeah. go ahead and eliminate this problem now. Yeah. Anybody that's going around messing with our children, kill them. Kill them. Kill them. I said it nice way, didn't I? Go ahead, kill them right kill now. Kill them. If they mess, if they're sexually abusing black children, you got to kill them now. If you don't, they gonna have power tomorrow. And when they get power tomorrow, that's all you are gonna see. Individuals who are running around, males with males and females with females, tell they got. A certain amount of time to change. Kill them. And if they don't change, well, the sister said it for them. If they don't change, give them a amount of time and do it. Because if you don't do it there in Africa, nobody else is going to do it nowhere else. That's right. So that's what you got to do. You got you to you say this got to change got to and change. make it change. All right. Robert Mugabe went on. He said he called Tony Blair's administration the gay government of the gay United Gay Kingdom. <laughs> 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 Come on, now we talked about European aggression, right? right. Sexual aggression now. You're going to really get out to these crackers now. Now, what is the worst insult you could put on a black man like this? Strong black man, he's against homosexuality in this country. And the most outspoken individual, probably one of the most outspoken people in the world against it. What's the worst insult they can heap on him? Call him one. Make him into one. That's right. Right. You go on the internet and look for a picture of Robert Mugabe. These crackers got this site. They don't tell you that it's a phony site. And they take pictures of all these so-called homosexuals and put Robert Mugabe's face, superimpose his face on top of it. This picture here you see here, the sick, this is the least. I had to find one picture. They did one picture I can show. The other ones are too sexually graphic to show. Wow. And so if you don't know Robert Mugabe and you go start studying and you go to this site, it's one of the first ones that comes up. That's what comes up. Now I want, to, I want to mention something real briefly. God need to kill them all off the planet. Well, she said I didn't. Don't say, don't say, he gave me, the sister said it. Now, I didn't disagree with her. <laughs> she said that, though. I didn't say that. But you look at this brother right here. I was saying, you know what? I noticed something about him. This is very interesting. Now, we don't like Europeans. You know PKB. That's pretty obvious if you've been here now. I would never, no matter what a European did, no matter how many saxophones Bill Clinton plays, I would never call him a black man. You know why? Because I respect black manhood. I love myself. Right. It's something valuable. So I would never try to insult my enemy by saying they're the same thing I am. Right. Now, if so-called homosexuality is something they really cherish and believe in, why do they heap it as an insult on somebody else? It's sexual aggression. The idea is not that they agree with it. The idea is that I want to take you somewhere where you don't want to go. Right. So they even know the old wickedness in their own ways. You can see it right here by the type of insult they hurled them on. Right. Talk about Sister Winnie Mandela. Why did she go to trial? We remember they had her on trial talking about she had this team and they were going around fighting and killing. But what was going on? Little did we know she was in the middle of a crisis too. She says on her trial, she said the circumstances that led to it, she was informed by Filati that there was a sick young boy who was in a mansion in the care of Reverend Paul Varon, a white priest, and that this young boy had been sodomized. Mm -hmm. Her whole thing about starting this male protective unit came about because they got these crackers over there with this Christianity, mm -hmm. Christianity promoting Jesus Christ and the apostles yeah. and raping black children. Yeah. And she said, wait a minute, this got to stop. <laughs> and we see the sister fighting this whole thing. See, I cannot believe that a minister of religion entrusted with children's lives would sexually abuse them. Children who could not make any other decisions but depend upon him. What kind of beast is this? Right. Mm -hmm. Who wears a collar on Sunday and goes to preach the prayers of these children and preaches the word of God even to some of these children. At night he becomes something else. Mm -hmm. No he doesn't. You ain't know who he was when you saw him. We're going to have to go after this. If you knew who that cracker was when you saw him, if you knew what his book was, if you knew what his religion was, if you knew what his sexual practices were, you wouldn't be confused. You would have known it was coming. That's right. And it's unfortunate because we never shared this with our brothers and sisters, and this is what we need to be doing. We don't need to be going to Africa, get this sister coming to America, visiting with black folks and who she visited with. Sure. Is she visiting with black people who are going to tell her no. 
the right thing to do? No. Tell her to go. God put Winnie Mandela on this planet to start a war in South Africa and get them dirty, filthy, child molested crackers the hell out. That's right. She was on her way to doing it, and what stopped her? Christian. Christian. Woo. Let's go. Let's talk about this Christian church. <laughs> Look, hey, I know it hurts, but let's be truthful. That's the truth. Does it inspire you to fight? Or does it inspire you to flight? If you're in this Christian church, let me tell you something. This is how you know the Christian church is garbage. The, the greatest preacher that stepped on these shores, and somebody might argue, I ain't going to argue with you too much. Somebody might say, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I wouldn't argue with you. But I'm going to say it was Nat Turner, because he's my favorite. When's the last time you heard a preacher mention Nat Turner? A Christian, supposedly a Christian, icon. You never hear it. How can you be in a church? 18 years and never heard Nat Turner's name mentioned. That's right, that's right. Only people you hear mentioned are people that will run. Nobody that will fight this cracker. That's how you know what you're part of is some garbage. Because right. all it makes you do is run. It makes you soft. It makes you not want to be a man. It makes you not want to have no manhood and not resist. And if you don't resist and you're racist in trouble, you're nothing. Come on. So they come here to this Negro. He used to be a good brother. Reverend Willie F. Wilson in Southeast Washington, D.C. Right, Union right. Temple Baptist Church. Oh, oh. He used to have a black community, had a nationalist community saying, yeah, we support this brother. We used to go there and say, we love this brother. We don't agree with Christianity, but you know what? You know what he's doing positive. We got to stop that. If it ain't right from the center, it ain't, right. ain't going to be right. right. We got to stop playing around this stuff. Yeah. Always because we're doing this work yeah. and we, we want to see what's good and we want to see something positive. Anybody that does a little something, Oprah Winfrey saying something about that, we want to yeah, stop that. You got to stop that. You gotta be right from the core. Then we can build on that. But if your foundation is wrong and weak, you wrong and weak. Yes, sir. Snick Road comes here. Money Man Challenge comes here. Gives one speech and says, this is what I need you to teach me. This was at Union Temple Baptist Church. We need you to teach us here how to love the enemies. How do we love whites? Because y'all seem to got it down here. Because we feel like we want to go to war with them. But, 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 but y'all tell us this is not the way to do it. So how do we do it? That's what the Christian church did. First she was on... Uh, Donahue, when her husband got out of jail, I watched it. She said, well, my husband doesn't want to fight just yet, and I'm going to respect him, but when it's time, I got my spear, and I'm ready to go on the battlefield for the freedom and independence of black people. Now she's looking for Jesus to save her. Yeah. Why she comes here to Southeast, yeah. to this Negro preacher, who out of, after all these years of being on the forefront, now all of a sudden telling black people to accept homosexuality. Yeah. Yeah. And he did it in one speech. It was called, one lecture called, uh, um, Unconditional love. The name of it was unconditional love. He started comparing so-called homosexuality with eating a seafood sandwich. I said, now, Negro, I don't care how early you got up this morning. Even when I get up late, I know that homosexuality and child molestation is not comparable to eating no goddamn seafood sandwich. Excuse my language. That's ridiculous. I'm sorry, excuse the language, but that's got to be ridiculous. And so I said, well, let me see what unconditional love is. Because I ain't know the term. Now, I'm not saying that he supports this. All I'm saying is it's real dangerous when you get surrounded by the wrong elements because strange things can happen. I looked up unconditional love on the internet and said, well, what is he talking about? It says, unconditional love is part of the philia sites, which provides news and resources to religious support groups for adults who are attracted to minors. The sites offer interfaith and secular material that will be of interest to all minor attracted adults and to other people seeking information about pedophilia and pederasty. I said, they promoting child molestation through the church. And I said, it's strange that the name of your lecture is that. Then I started looking who he got around me. Oh! Let's talk about Naomi. Wait a minute now. Uh, Let's talk about Naomi Akbar. Uh, yeah, brothers and sisters. Uh, uh, we got a fag in the middle. Uh, that ain't a place to have a fag. Not in the middle. Not in the middle, brother. No. Got this fag every men's day. Naeem Akbar. Who we thought, because of the things that he produced for our people, we thought that he cared about African people. I mean, changing them to the psychological slavery, man, that thing changed me. That's right. Uh, uh, community itself, I said, this brother's strong. No, this brother ain't strong. This brother's wrong. And he ain't our brother. His real goal and objective is to do just what he did to Reverend Willie Wilson. Because after years of being around this Negro, who is a open fag. Open yeah. who? Naeem Akbar. People in the national community who know him, they know he's a homo. Uh, know he left his wife and running around with this nigga all across the damn world. Yeah. Sleeping in the same bedroom, one bed with a damn 
fag, a flaming fag. I'm talking about one of them fags that you be like, look, you're too much fag for even fags, man. Go ahead, what's up, you know? One of them type fags. This is Akbar. And they gonna try to tell us he got visions of men. I don't like the visions you got for men. That's man. right. We need to get these Negroes out of our community. How can you come teach out? What about this Negro? Yeah. These are the individuals surrounding uh, 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 Willie Wilson. And now we see that feminization occurring because through the religion and through the association with individuals that are involved in evil misbehavior. That's right. This is George Augustus Stalin. Uh, this Negro is such a fag. You don't have to be in the nationalist community in D.C. to know he's a fag. Right. Talk to anybody that has any type of familiarity with this Negro. Yeah. They'll tell you stories. And you'll be like, well, can this many people have this many stories about a dude who's a fag and everybody don't, you know, do something about it? Yeah. Negro even left, once again, the feminization, not just being with other males. Yeah. This fag, flaming fag, leaves his, uh, uh, goes against Murray, he's a Catholic priest, and said, I can't marry black women because they're too difficult to deal with. Yeah. Marry some Asian. Yeah. Yeah. From Asia, so you know she don't know what's going on, so he can run around as many males as he wants, she don't know what's going on. Yeah. These are the individuals surrounding Reverend Willie F. Wilson. So he started promoting this thing, promoting his uh, uh, white sex, yep. so-called homosexuality, telling everybody in the black community we should accept it. So positive comedic visions under the leadership of the black unifier. We went to one of his rallies he held at his church, inside the church. Three-hour homo pro-white sex meeting. Yep. We going to our black BDUs, we sitting in a pew, about 300 homos. 150, 200 homos, I ain't count them. I ain't counting no homos now. Three are homos. You can give me a job, but counting homos ain't gonna be my job. You count the damn homos. Right. But there's a lot of three hours promoting white sex. Females kissing in the pews. Yeah. Am I lying? No, sir. A Negro named Rainy Cheeks, who's a right. gay priest, stood up on the stage. These are his words. I'm not being vulgar, brother. So these are his words. Now this is a church. This is a church. Well, we know that you know there's some you know people don't like this homosexuality, but let me tell you something. I'm gay. I may be gay, but I'm a man, and if I have to go down, I'm gonna have somebody's balls in my hand. Whoa. So it was like, man, this is this is more saturated with filth than we expected. We thought it'd just be a regular Negro, but these Negroes going way over the top. Negroes talking all kind of vulgar terminology on the stage about being ah. Anyway, all that went through, and they went for three hours. They had to. They had the microphone set up for people to do questions and answers. And then? Yeah, yeah, you know what happened, right? Yeah. See, if you don't know nothing about a black unified by now, yeah. I doubt you'll ever know, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you like That's this. Right. I was getting a little disappointed because three hours had gone by, and when the question and answer period came up, Reverend Wilson told all the homos to gather around the church, big church, holding hands. So now we're sitting in the middle. <laughs> There's a couple of us. <laughs> Sitting in the middle of a bunch of fags, not like in a car, then, but in a big church. <laughs> yeah, I gotta clear that up, cause look, we don't want nobody saying, get one little piece of the tape and mess with this joint up, and Jack got to rest some bandits, you know, you know how that goes. We don't get this twisted now. I'm sorry, but I just gotta tell you how it happened, cause this is how it happened. This is what happened. So I'm sitting there saying to myself, man, I'm really disappointed. I really wanted us to express, you know, how we felt. So Reverend Wilson doing his prayer, we looking out there and the people looking in on us and we holding hands and all this. Um, next thing I hear, you see us standing out here. We part of this black community too. We don't like what you're doing. I said, oh, it's about to start now. Right. The black unifier was in now and it's on. It's on. Now I don't know why this happened, but the only groups of normal males in there are heterosexual, for lack of a better word, of black men was PKV and a security force for Reverend Wilson. Yes. Now why these brothers, I know it's a horrible situation, you part of something you're supposed to be protecting, man you gotta go get fight against some brothers who are fighting for a righteous cause on behalf of some homos that you don't even like. Mm -hmm. So one of them, I don't know why he did it, I wouldn't have done it, I mean you know. He tries to grab the microphone no, from the black unifier. No, sir. And as he lay upon the ground beneath the pew, <laughs> My eyes just gazed asunder <laughs> as all of us flooded to the middle of the floor. And then you got all these brothers fighting and brought over some facts. Got black men going to war over some damn facts. So the faggot on the, on the stage, uh, Stalin's faggot, jumped up. Let him speak, let him speak. I said, boy, this fag something. How does fag take over? And I said, what's something? Let him speak. 
And the Black Unified went to the microphone oh, and he made a statement that was so profound, even the homos that were standing there, you could hear a pin drop. That's right. And when he finished with the statement, part of the statement, they, had, they, even, they even printed it in the article. He said, we love everybody in here, but we hate your ways. He said, black homosexuals are indeed sick. They are sexually backward brothers and sisters. And he said that homosexuality is related to undue influ uh, influence by European. Brother he went on to say some other things. Brother Kush said that? That's Brother Kush. Okay. Let's get our brother a round of applause. Okay. Now let's be clear. Now let's be clear. Are you clapping because he knocked the brother out or are you clapping because he was doing the right thing? Oh, oh. oh okay. Well, I guess a clap is a clap, brother. That's right. And there was a real interesting situation. The brother finally said, you know, you used to be one of my heroes. To this day, Reverend Willie F. Wilson goes around this town traveling with a homo yep. who's in charge of the food and health thing for his yep. uh, 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 organization, goes around to stores traveling with a homo picking out food. Mm. Men don't travel with homos. No right. Mm. Men, black men, know that we have manhood to preserve so we don't do stuff like that. Well, but see... This Christian religion is a strange thing, brother. Says, yeah. Hey, let's talk about it. Let's talk about some of the individuals that the European makes us love. This is a brother who we found at this point in time a great deal of love and honor for. Mm. Named Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. But we gotta start re-examining the record, brothers and sisters. Tell the me. truth is the truth. Tell yes, sir. Right. The truth. November 17th, 1957. This is one of his speeches. I'm just clipping a little piece. He says, the Greek language comes to our aid beautifully in giving us the real meaning and depth of the whole philosophy of love. Yeah, I guess so. He said, wait a minute. We talked about the Greeks and what the Greeks were all about. And the problem is that the Greeks were pre-Christian era. So a Negro talking about Greeks is not talking about Christianity. He's talking about culture. What is there about Greek culture that Martin Luther King Jr. wants to get across to black people? He goes on to say, then the Greek language talks about philia. We just saw what the philia says about. Mm -hmm. And that's another type of love that's also beautiful. Not king. Mm -hmm. Well, who was Martin Luther King following, brothers and sisters? Oh, oh, that him. You got to come back tomorrow because we're going to finish the job. We're going to start it today, but tomorrow we're going to finish it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Said, who was the one behind the whole civil rights movement? Yeah. Brothers and sisters, this is very sad, but it was a flaming, oh. outward right. homosexual. Who gave Martin Luther King all the advice on the strategies that he would use to lead our people to nonviolence? So, in essence, we had a black man who knew that his race did not agree with homosexuality, who was following a homo and Stanley Levinson, who was a small hat, a homosexual in a small hat, and told us to follow him. Consequently, if you remove the middleman, we will follow in a homo right. with this whole nonviolent civil rights movement. Right. Come back tomorrow. And then you ain't gonna have to worry about my words. We're gonna look at it. We're gonna go deep into it tomorrow. Let's talk about this. This is from Ralph Abernathy's book, just so you can see that uh, how much they relied upon uh, these individuals outside of King, who he was really following. Ralph Abernathy and the Walls King coming to down. He says King wanted reassurance from them that he was making a wise move in postponing the march. But Greenberg, or what? Smart. Harry Watchtail? Clarence Jones and Barrett Rustin, a white sex offender, from the vantage point of a thousand miles were full of clarity and courage. In some cases, these people had given us support and good advice. This time, they confused Martin and made his decision that much more difficult and painful. Let's go on. But on the strength of Martin's vision of what the Poor People's Campaign could accomplish, we went ahead with plans. We talked to our advisors in New York, including Barrett Rustin and Stanley Levinson. Mm. Remember, Cristobal Colon was a small hat. Right. He's following a fag and a, and a, and a, and a homo. Let me see how, how evil this really gets. Right. Now, one movement, the so-called civil rights movement, is telling people nonviolence is the only way. Sit there and let them abuse you. Mm -hmm. Another movement, the Black Power Movement, is saying, I'm not nobody's beat-up toy. That's we want right. to build our own schools. That's we right. want to stop being abused by the police. We want to be men and women exactly. with some integrity. Right. We're not going to tolerate abuse. Right. Right. And they saying, y'all are evil. Y'all hate because y'all don't want to say abuse. Let's see what Barrett Rustin said on the phone that was tapped. This is a tap phone conversation between Barrett Rustin and Martin Luther King. King said in a phone call to Rustin in March, I've come to the conclusion that I see no possibilities of working with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Mm -hmm. There's no hope. Barrett went further. 
These people are no win. And sooner or later, King, you're just going to have to cut yourself off from them. There is nothing to be gained with a continuing relationship with SNCC in these projects. You're going to have to just draw the line. You got a fag telling a black man right. who's supposed to be a leader right. that he can't work with independent groups of black people who want to do something for the black people in the black community. Right. He went any further. King agreed. They are violent. They worship Malcolm X. Like Malcolm X, some kind of yeah. right. devil or villain. Right. Right. They have a strong nationalistic attitude, but he said he would continue to go and work with them. Mm. Come back tomorrow. Because suffice it to say, it's evil to know that you're following a homo and you know your people don't agree with that. And you wouldn't let your people have the benefit of knowing that. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care what they said, your parents and our grandparents, if they had known Martin Luther King was following a the homo, they said, King, you dropped the homo or we're going to have to find somebody else to represent us because you ain't living right. That's evil to keep that away from our people. That's right. That's right. Well, well, she said it, I didn't say it. <laughs> but if you turn to the first page of your King James, go home with it, pull out your King James. King James. The Holy Bible. Where's, where's all of this lack of desire to defend yourself? Where's all of this effeminization on a spiritual level? Where's that left foot forward that trampled down evil so that heart can go forward? It's gone. Our mind's caught up somewhere else. And the cracker tells us just what to do with it. First page. Tell you something ain't right about it. The Holy Bible containing the Old and New Testaments translated out of the original tongues. And with the former translations diligently compared and revised. Diligent. Diligently compared and revised, that means changed. Yeah. That's right. By His Majesty's special command, authorized King James Version. Who was he? Who was King James? Oh, well, I was going to skip this part. But if Africans ask why, we must tell. Let's see who was <laughs> uh, Well... Is that king or queen? He was such a notorious homo in England. They referred, the whites called him Queen James. In other words, it was a homosexual culture. But he was so overt with it, always adopting these little boys. What he would do is he would go get these little young white males and give them positions. You can be the Earl of this, the Duke of that. Give them these positions in exchange for his sexual, with, yeah, you know Europeans by now. We know Europeans, right? Right. So I don't have to explain what he would do with him, right? right? So let's go see. He was being talked about so much that he got sick of all the individuals in the, in the country talking about him. So he decided he would go to uh, a governing body, the Privy Council, a legislative body. He said, let me go to them. Let me let them know what's going on. I have a right to love men. This was in 1617. He addressed the venerable Privy Council with his official, this is an official document. Official affirmation of his right to love men. I, James, am neither a god nor an angel, but a man like any other, a white male like any other. That's what he said. Therefore, I act like a white male and confess to loving those dear to me more than other men. You may be sure that I love the Earl of Buckingham more than anyone else and more than you who are here assembled. I wish to speak in my own behalf and not to have it thought to be a defect. For Jesus Christ did the same thing. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I cannot be blamed. Christ had John and I had George. <laughs> so he's saying, look, hey, hey if, you don't, if you ain't done your research on this European history, I would suggest you might want to leave that church alone and definitely that book. That book, is said it was authorized by a known admitted child molester. And he says, this is my version. Let me translate it PKV style. The child molesting faggot's version of spirituality. And that's what we got. And that's the kind of movement we're going to produce out of this garbage cheap using. You see here, he talked about Christ had John and I had Jordan. Now, this is the European concept of God. Here's his God. And you see John there. It looked like they maybe changing some blessings or what. I don't know what you got going on here in Germany. We didn't make it up. This is their concept of God. We're going to move on, get on out of here. We got another day tomorrow, come back and finish this thing up. But let's go inside this book just to see that it ain't just who did it, but that there's something in there that you don't want to be part of either. Numbers 31, 17, 31, 18. Now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones, aggression, and kill every woman that has known man by lying with them, misogyny. But all the women children that have not known a man by lying with them, keep alive for yourselves. 
literally got the cracker saying that God told him in certain instances to go around and kill every male in sight, but keep the little virgin little baby girl to yourself. That's in your book. You can go back to the people tomorrow. It ain't your book no more. Yeah. And so that's why we see if you want to hide, ain't no better place for a white sex offender. Yeah, yeah. No better place to hide than behind Jesus. Yeah. Right. Right. We're going to talk tomorrow too about this Negro, this fat, detestable Negro who just put a juvie out on our people. Don't let me forget to talk about that. Thou are loose. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. Thou are loose by that. What's that Negro's name? T.D. Jakes. That's a horrible Negro. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. Uh, now, we're literally in a stage, brothers and sisters, where individuals in our community that look like us are promoting child molestation. Yeah. Yeah. Saying that it's okay, you got this guy, they call him R. Kelly, urinating on black children. Yeah. Yeah. And we let him live. Yeah. Yeah. He's running around our communities, assaulting our community. And the Arabs, see, I want you to see the difference. Mm -hmm. When the Arabs saw the first picture of an Arab male being forced to engage in sexual deviance with another Arab male in those prisons, Cracker's head start getting cut off. Yes, yes, right. Yes, right. Compare and contrast. Yep. When black people saw a video of a Negro, a monster, a cracker in black skin, yep. raping a little black girl yep. over and over and pissing on her, yep. we bought as many tickets as we could, That's went it. to his concerts, right. and said, Jesus will forgive him. Right. God damn it, I don't want no Jesus forgiveness. And we can't forgive no Negroes that abuse our people. Right. Take that weak stuff. That's your stuff. Give it back to the cracker. Right. We're strong people. Yep. We're productive people. Yep. We don't go about abusing and watching abuse go on. We do something about it. That's right. We know right from wrong. <laughs> can't no people survive under the system of racism and white supremacy who don't fight. That's right. We watch as these various other groups all around the world fight European aggression. And what do we do? Sit back, no. Sit back and do nothing. No. And support them. Negro is actually promoting it. Why don't you look at this picture? He did this, this album for this female named Aaliyah, young girl, young black girl, 15 years old. Yeah. Where he was having uh, rape, and that's what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah. Sexual white sex with the little girl. And named her album, Age Ain't Nothing But a Number. Mm -hmm. Subliminally sending a message, it's okay to molest children. Right. Got him standing in the background like a sexual predator that he is. Yeah. And we let him live. He should be, his blood should be falling in the drains of the streets. He should be in somebody's trash can somewhere. How can we sit alive? How can we pretend that we're a race of people who care about our future? And we let individuals who openly abuse our children walk freely. No man. The chocolate factory. Now he's so bold now that we allowed him to do it and get away with it. Now he's like, I'm just going to go ahead and use every child theme I can think of right, right, right. to promote child molestation. And he calls himself the Pied Piper. Yep. Right. Always got to do your research, brothers and sisters. Oh. When you see evil, start looking for it and understand it. You want to understand evil, only way you're going to know how to fight it. Wolfgang Mata, the Pied Piper of Hamlet. Who was the Pied Piper? In the year of the 700th anniversary of the German legend, the Pied Piper of Hamlet, this phrase can be used and interpreted positively or negatively. Just as the original legend itself actually portrays the Pied Piper as an ambivalent figure, both good and evil, as a rat catcher, he is altogether a benevolent magician, but as an abductor of 130 innocent children, wow. young adults, mm. he becomes malevolent and evil as the devil himself. Mm. Some modern Pied Pipers could be politicians, leaders of religious sects, rock stars, teachers, or whatever, but all attempting, all attempting to lead people to some type of goal. What goal are we talking about? We're talking about right. genocide, brothers and sisters. Right. We at the end of this lecture here today, brothers and sisters, and this is what we're going to do. Today, we dealt with who we were before the European. Who the European was. What happened when we came together and the type of atrocities that they committed against us physically to turn us out and get us confused and turn us, create the situation we see in our community today. Then we went a little bit today, a little bit into the effeminization, which goes beyond sexual abuse, which goes to strip the resistance against white power out of us. Tomorrow, we're going to go deep into it. Tomorrow, we're going to look at the imagery. We're going to see how they're using these imageries all around them. We're going to do a lot of imagery tomorrow, a lot of film, a lot of stuff so we can see how they're saturated and how the war is waged. 
and then we're going to finish up so that we have a full, complete understanding and understand of what we have to do as a people to get out of the situation. I thank you, brothers and sisters, for listening. I hope to see you again tomorrow. If a sister that out of that God, the man's broken by she goes to the bed at night, lusting after the female. She can't build no nation. You're wasting your, my, and our racist black time. Leave them alone. Mr. One, brothers and sisters, you gotta stand up. Death to white supremacy, fight this homosexual assault on our children, yo. And death to this faggot shit, too. Let's go. Yeah. Somebody spiked your lemonade, you dealing with a renegade. I'm thinking about getting free and thinking about getting paid. The time to make a change mentally, you still a slave and misbehave like the same beast who came out the cave. No matter how you word it, homosexual perversion. That ain't African and that's a fact about that, I'm certain. Your rappers is fruity, smelling like booty. Faggots wear skinny jeans, don't matter if it's Gucci. Smoke you like a Lucy just for thinking you could do me. You messing with Louie, yo faggot, I like think you got swag, but I think you a fag. Lil Wayne look like a dyke. Rappers dressing in drag. Should be rapping at the gate parade. Mohawk with funny shades. Fruity dudes looking sick. Somebody gay this lemon AIDS. This ain't gay bashing this murder. Straight caskets. Nickel plated magnum. I see you. I'm straight blasting. Face gashes. Razor. Straight slashing. Gasoline lighter. Fire. Straight ashes. Running straight past him. You hear me? I'm straight faggot. And I don't think faggot, you hear me? I hate faggots. Yeah. Yes, I'm homophobic, keep it moving like aerobics. Word. Diddy's bending over, he's a faggot, and I know it. Uh -huh. This brother's a poet, all the honeys want to go with you. Gay marriage is legal now, you dummies uh -huh. want support it. Extinction agenda, dudes acting XX, real moist and tender. Ask why, when it comes to defense, see we the first line. Our seeds getting turned down, blind in the Third eye, born that way, man, you might as well go back to church. Babies born into sin, infants get the urge. You folk make me sick, don't want to put up resistance. Negroes, new religion, is blind acceptance. This faggot ish ain't African, peep the writings on the wall. That's a man, that's a woman, that's a boy, that's a girl. Every homie's exit only, testimony on a stack of Bibles. This phenomenon is genocide, fighting for African survival. Abortions ain't fast enough, black on black ain't fast enough, crack and smack ain't fast enough, as they move on mama Africa, live grenade at your pride parade, yeah I'm trying to blow you up, man to man it's so unjust, man to man it's so unjust, man to man and mandating, women with fitters and they pants sagging, babies confused I can't have no love for you damn faggots, if you living and riffing, I'm lifting you off the damn canvas, chick flex like a dude, get hit like a man damn it.